the river of blood has finally dried up. The war between the human world and the demon world that lasted for decades was left in history as an eerie record called the Age of Destruction. And the day when the victory of the human world is engraved on the rock. A head was hung at the main gate of the Baskerville family, famous for being a family of iron blooded swords. Name, Bakir van Baskerville. Crime, Internal Communication. Bakir van Baskerville. The illegitimate son of Hugo Les Baskerville, the head of the Baskerville family. A shadow that has had countless blood on its hands behind the family's back. It was the hunting dog of the Baskerville family. Episode 1 Hellhound, 1. Vikir. He struggled. It was a life of constant struggle. Bastard. A concubine's child. He was not born with surnames such as R.A. or Hlu, which were given to him for free by his half-brothers in the family, and because of that, he had to work hundreds of times harder than others. But the ending wasn't so good. Spying, assassination, kidnapping, blackmail, smuggling he crossed over 500 obstacles, big and small, for his family, but in the end, luck failed him. The moment when he was accused of being a spy for the demons and was falsely accused and executed. He thought intensely. I want to live. I want to come back to life. Ba, ba, ba. The sound of a baby crying echoes throughout the large room. Dozens of auspicious events happened to the Baskerville family, a family of iron blooded swordsmen. The head of the family, Hugo the Marquis of Baskerville, looked indifferently at the children born this year. There are no people who look useful. For a father's first evaluation of children born this year, it was quite harsh. At that time, Hugo's feet stopped at a certain point as he passed by the cradles in the nursery. Vikir. Vikir van Baskerville. Originally, I was an illegitimate child who didn't even deserve to be here. Unlike the other siblings who are nearly six to eight months old, this one has only just completed 100 days of life and has barely entered this room. The baby wasn't crying. It just lay still, with its eyes closed, as if dead. Hugo's expression softened slightly as he looked at Vikir. He is not happy because Vikir's qualities seem superior to those of his other children. However, I thought that if it was a place where there was only trash lying around anyway, it would be better to have trash that was a little less noisy. Soon, Hugo spoke to the dozens of nannies standing behind him. Move the children to the cradle of stabs. The children of the Baskervilles are put to the test from the moment they are born until their death. From cradle to grave. The first of these tests began right away. What is the cradle of the sword? It is a unique rite of passage for the Baskervilles. Countless knives are placed on a round hill like a maze and a baby is dropped in the middle of it. The baby becomes trapped and wanders in the maze created by the blade. A situation where even if you move, you will be cut by a blade and have wounds all over your body. In this environment, the baby must crawl across the floor and escape through a maze of knife needles. It is only when you take a dip in the river, Styx, that flows around the outside of the maze that you become Baskerville in the true sense of the word. Hugo Baskerville thought. Styx river water is only effective for children under one year of age. When you take a dip in this river, your whole body becomes as hard as steel. Of course, the power of this river is not infinite. If one baby absorbs as much power as possible, the other baby has no choice but to absorb relatively little of the remaining power in the river. It's like a mother's milk line. The children of the Baskervilles were now thrown into a cradle of swords. Who will get out of this labyrinth first and jump into the river first? That will determine the future of these children. Thirty-two children born this year, including the family's legitimate children, illegitimate children, and cousins, brothers and sisters, compete against each other in the center of the cradle of the sword. The blades, densely packed in a snail shell pattern, were guiding the children as far and sharp as possible along the thorny path. Ba, ba, badge. A boy crying desperately looking for a nanny, a boy already crawling nimbly, a boy bleeding and struggling after touching a blade, a guy lying down and sucking his fingers as if he had no intention of escaping yet this is generally what babies look like. In fact, it is a natural result as these babies are less than a year old. However, Insignificant things. Hugo Baskerville's assessment was extremely cold. A small and weak creature. 
a creature that cannot survive without the help of others. Hugo's gaze upon the human body was filled with contempt. Even if it is your child, there are no exceptions. He was one of the top seven swordsmen on the continent and was famous for being an Iron Man from birth. Is this how we can fight the demons of the demon world? When are you going to raise these things and entrust them to me? Hugo stood high and lamented as he looked at the river Styx flowing around the cradle of the sword. Across all continents, the secret river that only flows in the Baskerville sacred place has the effect of increasing mana, purifying horrors, and making one's whole body as tough and hard as steel just by immersing one's body in it. If it wasn't only effective for children under one year old, would have soaked it myself. When Hugo was looking at the river with a wistful expression. Hey, over there. Ah, this can't be happening. Nonsense. Shock erupted from everywhere. What could possibly shock the family's guardian knights, who are unfazed by most things? Hugo raised his head with a puzzled expression. And that moment. His eyes, which had been filled with only extreme boredom, contempt, impatience, and disappointment, were filled with a strange look. The Cradle of Stab Wounds This is because a child was going straight to the river sticks through this dense forest of blades. Cut KKK fit. The child's body is already covered in blood. Surprisingly, the child was moving in a straight line through the cradle of knife needles, which were stretched out in a spiral pattern like a snail shell. Rather than circling a relatively safe path, it directly squeezes through the small gap between the blades. There was a knife mark on his white, soft cheek. My soft and plump back and forearms were all cut and torn. My knees were all scratched and my pretty palms were already covered in blood. A child crawling over countless knife needles, creating a path of red blood. Everyone in the family was overwhelmed by the spirit radiating from this child, who was less than 100 days old. It was the same even for Hugo Les Baskerville, the head of the Iron Blood Swordsman Baskerville. Eventually, the child completely escaped the maze. The brothers were still trapped in the center of the stabbed cradle and could not escape. With a plop. As soon as the child came out of the cradle, he threw himself into the river Styx. The river water turns red. Hugo made a rare move forward and grasped the railing with both hands. The servant's eyes widened when they saw the crack in the marble railing. This was because it was the first time I had seen him, who usually showed an emotionless attitude towards everything, become this much agitated. Kid! What about the child? What happened to my child? Hugo raised his voice. The child who fell into the river Styx still hasn't come up. Soon, several of the family's guardian knights approached the river Styx and looked into it. And. The knights were all frightened. Well, you are drinking water from the river. It was an answer that made Hugo's mouth drop open. Episode 2 Hellhound, 2. Where am I? Vikir checked his body. There is no mana. There is no strength. There is not a single ounce of aura that has been accumulated as much as the empty space of blood that has been spewed out while crossing countless lines of fire. Have I fallen into hell? But that's not it. This place it is too barren to even be called hell. A place where cranes fall so much that even hell would make you cry. Because that is the Baskerville family. There is no way I would not know the atmosphere of the place where I lived as a hunting dog for the past thirty years. The smell of blood, pus, and everything that died dirty. Vikir van Baskerville had a hunch. He realized that he had returned to the time when he was not long after he was born. What should I do now? A body that has just lived for about 100 days. There isn't much that can be done. Is it as simple as turning over and signaling to the nanny in the communal nursery to breastfeed? Right then. There are no people who look useful. A familiar voice was heard. Hugo Les Baskerville, the head of the Baskerville family, was seen standing in the center of the nursery. The moment he heard his voice, Vikir quickly stood up and almost prostrated himself, as was his habit in life. Fortunately, it was impossible because it was a newborn baby's body. Puzzle. When he sees the main culprit who framed him and executed him, he automatically grits his teeth. However, since the body had not yet developed teeth, no sound was heard. Let's calm down. 
the days of revenge and shame as he struggled to become a member of the Baskerville family, to be recognized by his father, and to get rid of the pretense of being an illegitimate child. Inferior blood. The past life that was like a dried blood stain is now goodbye. I will live differently in this life. If the rabbit disappears, you won't end up living the life of a boiled hound. Right then. There was an opportunity that made Vikir's resolve even stronger. Move the children to the cradle of stabs. Hugo's words were heard. Vikir thought as he was carried out by the nurse. Is this the first rite of passage? The cradle of the sword is a journey to the river Styx, which flows through a small hill. The moment they cross the wall made of swords and take a dip in the river Styx, the Baskerville children are reborn as warriors. Of course, the lifeline of the river Styx does not give abundant strength to everyone. Diet of the fittest, survival of the fittest. It is the same from birth for strong people to eat a lot. The Baskerville children must escape the cradle of stings as quickly as possible and take a dip in the river Styx. You have to soak in the river as quickly as possible and for as long as possible to gain an advantage over your brothers. So Vikir moved as soon as he was thrown into the center of the cradle of swords. Cook. Twist and press the blade with both cute hands. It is said that children from certain prestigious families catch various things that help their future when they become stone catchers, but children from the Baskerville family have to catch blades that threaten their future from the time they become stone catchers. Spit, pot, crackling, crunch. The blade cuts through the entire body. Every time I used my strength to squeeze through the blades, I felt a burning pain throughout my body. But it doesn't matter. This level of pain is something I am already used to after living as a hunting dog for the past several decades. When you scratch, bite, or press someone, these are things you have already experienced hundreds of times as a reaction. Moreover, the deeper the wound, the better to allow the water of the river Styx to penetrate the body better. Vikir knew all the secrets, legends, myths, and ghost stories of the Baskervilles. Therefore, they also know how to make the most of the river Styx. Ugh ugh ugh. The child's soft body is led to hell by the tough and strong soul of the hunting dog. Blood root. Red road. The blood flowing from the body and running down the ramp was showing the straight route and shortest distance to move forward. Vikir continued to crawl in the direction indicated by his blood drop. And soon, we reached the sacred ground of the Baskervilles. The river Styx flows through a swampy area. If you soak in this place, your body will become as hard as steel and your soul will become infinitely clearer. Vikir threw himself into the river in the fetal position. With a plop. Heavy. It was painful, like being in boiling molten iron. Water so hot that steam rises. I fell here with countless stab wounds all over my body, so there's no way it wouldn't be painful. But Vikir endured the pain that felt like he was being boiled. And he waited. The waters of the river Styx seep into the cuts, tears, and bursting wounds. Yet. Tsutsutsutsu. The body began to change. The water of Styx seeped into the wound and into the bones and intestines, changing Vikir's body from top to bottom. It's definitely different. Vikir was surprised that a good first start could make such a dramatic difference. In my previous life, my body was tough and skilled, but it was small and thin. Because the bones themselves were weak, there were limitations in attaching muscles, and because the mana barrel was narrow, there were clear limitations in generating aura. But the brothers were different. Tall, thick bones, and a spacious mana tank. It's a difference in talent, quality, and starting point. In his previous life, Vikir had come out of the Tower of Stings in last place. Therefore, the effects of the river Styx were not fully enjoyed. This is because all the brothers have already absorbed that power. After that, due to his background as an illegitimate child and poor talent, he was always given only the last year of his career. When others eat clean things, wear clean things, sleep in clean places, and do clean things. He had to eat dirty things, wear dirty things, sleep in dirty places, and do only dirty work. The results achieved in this way were always owned by half-brothers. It was the same in the war against demons. No matter how many demons or demons I kill, the credit always belongs to my father or half-brothers. There was almost no compensation. 
It wasn't just the demons that had to be killed, but also his father's enemies and humans. He had to actively move back and forth between all seven great houses, spying, assassinating, espionage, ambushing, and intimidating, thereby raising the Baskervilles to the highest position among the seven great families. But what was the result? Tisagyuping, cook the dog to death. When the rabbit disappears and the hunting is over, the hunting dogs are no longer needed, so they are boiled and eaten. Accused of conspiring with the demons, Bakir was executed, bearing all of Hugo's dirty crimes. His sin was only one. Knowing too much. Crunch. Bakir gritted his teeth. The teeth that had begun to grow into the mouth were clashing fiercely. The waters of the river Styx rushed in with anger that reached the marrow of the bones, soon turning the bones thicker, the flesh tougher, and the mana barrel wider. Of course, the searing pain kept coming, but it didn't matter. Bikir began to drink water. The idea was to definitely strengthen the internal organs. He was thinking of an old legend passed down in the Baskerville family. A long time ago, there was an invincible warrior in Baskerville, right? The strongest swordsman who didn't even have a scratch on his skin, let alone a bone, even when hit by an axe. But his end was truly absurd. A poisoned arrow shot by a rival from another family hit him in the heel, and he died from the aftereffects. That's because when he was a baby, his nurse held him by both ankles and dipped him upside down into the river Styx, and the nurse's palm made the part that was not touched by the river water relatively weak. That part shouldn't exist. Bikir stirred himself in the river as best he could. I twist my body as best I can so that no part of me touches the water. In the meantime, the wound was opened, but it was even better. This is because the water can properly penetrate into the body. Bubble bubble bubble. The blood drains out and I become delirious. I was out of breath and wanted to quickly get to the surface. But that can't be possible. The river Styx does not accept a child once it leaves its arms. If you put your head out to breathe, your head will no longer receive protection. So Vikir held on desperately, holding on to a stone in the river. I continued to wave my arms so that the river water reached the palms holding the stones. At that time, I hear faint voices in my ears. Young master. You need to come out. If you stay underwater longer than that, you'll die. Oh my god. Maybe this is good. Get it. You have to rescue me. There seems to be an uproar from above. Well, that has to be the case. Excessive greed can be poisonous. It's good to strengthen your body, but isn't it better to suffocate and die? Even. Son. Come up now. Hugo Les Baskerville's voice can also be heard. But that voice only fuels Bakir's misfortune even more. Sukuk. Bakir stood up. But it didn't just happen. Gulp, 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 gulp. I drink a mouthful of water from the river Styx. Until the very end. And. Puha dash. As soon as you come up, take a deep breath of air. Bakir opens his mouth wide to breathe. When Hugo Les Baskerville sees him, he smiles brightly, which is rare. Ha ha ha, do you see this guy? Haven't you already got teeth? A hunting dog boiled in boiling water showed its fangs. Episode 3 Hellhound, 3 Baby Vakir, Vakir Van Baskerville He was now lying outside the unlit shared child care room. There is not much that can be done with a child's body that cannot stand on its own. I just suckle at my nanny's milk and think over the situations before my return. Eight years old. She felt mana for the first time. She was a talent who could be called a genius in the world, but within the Baskerville family, she was just ordinary. Fifteen years old. He accumulated one circle level mana. His sword was able to emit a faint aura. Twenty years old. It began to be put into practice in earnest. He was mainly responsible for tasks such as assassination, espionage, and subjugation of barbarians. Twenty-five years old. Is it because I live twice as intensely as others? The subordinates of the Baskerville family now possessed a level of swordsmanship that was not even reached in their thirties. Twenty-nine years old. There were clear limits to how illegitimate children could grow. The Orthodox people, 
who seemed to be lagging behind for a moment, began to move ahead as soon as they gained practical experience, and soon disappeared so far ahead that they were not even visible. Thirty years old. The gate to the demon world opened and numerous demons began to invade. Thirty-five years old. He endured the era of destruction with his bare body, gained a lot of combat experience, and killed more monsters than anyone else. Thirty-nine years old. Won the war empire. It was a valuable victory for the human alliance. Forty years old. Life as a loyal hunting dog all his life. But the Baskervilles did not repay that loyalty. What came back was a frame and false accusation that he had conspired with the demons. And it was the blade of the guillotine. Wow. Once again, my hatred for Hugo Baskerville rises. When Vikir ground his teeth, the nurse was startled and took him away from her arms. Ah, I hear you grind your teeth like this sometimes. She laid Vikir in the cradle and stood up. Now that my shift is over, it's time to switch to another nanny. But. Sigh. The nanny, who would normally have left through the door, looked around and then went to the bed on the other side. Come on, young masters. Please drink milk. The nanny began to breastfeed some of the children she had breastfed earlier. The Baskerville's children are raised together in one room. This is to raise all children equally. But which mother would treat her own child and her half-child equally? Some mothers memorized the characteristics of their children and told the nurse to ask them to breastfeed for a longer period of time. Of course, it was a request that was difficult to expect for Vakir, who did not know who his mother was, so he had no choice but to set aside all expectations. At least you need to grow up to the point where you can get food with your own hands to be able to do anything quickly. Right then. Something somewhat unexpected happened. The nanny looked around and approached Vakir's cradle again. Ugh. Madam too. What is this? Put it in Master Vakir's cradle. Lady. There are few people in this family worthy of being called madam. And there is even less reason for such a being to ask someone to bring something to him. The nanny took out a fairly large box from her arms, but it seemed like she had no idea what was inside. Rattling. The nurse placed the box in Vakir's cradle and tilted her head a few times. And then he ran out of the nursery at a brisk pace. Vikir quietly looked at the box next to him. Did you have any memories like this before returning? There wasn't anything in particular. He lifted his head with difficulty and looked out of the cradle. Vikir's cradle is quite far away from the other cradles. Something doesn't feel right. And ominous predictions always come true. Squeak squeak. Soon, something poked its head out of the box. A gift for a newborn baby. Snake. Two snakes with black triangular heads were exposing their thick bodies outside the box. Bloody Mamba. A poisonous snake, also known as the Chilbosa, seven steps to death, because if bitten it dies before it can take seven steps. It is a rare species that is rarely found in the world. Vikir was dumbfounded and opened his mouth half open. Who released this snake here? It looks like the nanny left without knowing what she had solved. Vikir, who was taken aback for a moment, soon grasped the situation. Come to think of it, babies often die mysteriously in childcare rooms. Children who had outstanding and extraordinary abilities from birth were more likely to die young. In the meantime, I thought it was a different world from my own and that it was just an accidental death, assassination from an enemy, or bad luck. But looking at it now, the situation is not good at all. The dark hand targeting the nursery was clearly coming from within the family. Hissing. Two bloody mambas are coming towards us. The red mouth with flashing fangs seemed to be already covered in blood. If anything goes wrong, all the children in this nursery could be killed. If that happens, an unprecedented catastrophe will occur in the history of the Baskervilles. Well, that's not bad either. I have no attachment to my family at all. However, if the destruction begins with oneself, it becomes a problem. Bikir stretched out his hand. Going through the era of destruction, monsters have been struck and killed countless times. I had faced countless reptile-type monsters, especially those in the shape of snakes, and of course I knew their weakness as well. Even the body of a newborn was enough. Quack. 
Bikir stretched out both hands and each caught a poisonous snake. The place where I caught it was exactly near the nape of the neck. It is a place where the snake's teeth cannot reach. Rather, the snakes that were attacked first are embarrassed and struggle. They tried to stab the enemy with their sharp scales, but it was impossible because Vakir's body was already hardened by the protection of the river sticks. It may be teeth, but scales don't leave even a scratch. At the same time, Vakir used the mana of his entire body. The mana tank, which had been empty since birth, was now filled with quite a bit of mana. This was the result of drinking the water of the river sticks to the limit. Pot. Both fists began to emit sparkling light. This is a state that the babies gathered here in the nursery will only reach in the next eight years. Bikir accomplished this in less than eight months after being born. Satsutsatsu. The bodies of the two poisonous snakes become stiff. It is the providence of the wild that the body becomes sluggish when faced with a top predator. The two poisonous snakes seem to have felt unprecedented fear from the milk-scented child in front of them, and froze with their scales erect. Soon, Bikir's mana-filled hand viciously twisted the necks of the two poisonous snakes. Crack. The skin and flesh underneath are intact, but the bones that support them are broken. The two poisonous snakes each opened their mouths wide. Due to the pressure, both eyeballs popped out and the tongue was stuck out. The two poisonous snakes with broken necks trembled at that moment and died, pouring out feces and urine. Deadly poison was dripping from the tips of its clearly exposed fangs. Next day. Hearing the screams of the nanny who came to work first, all the guardian knights in the family gathered in the shared childcare room. Vikir, smiling brightly, was holding two poisonous snakes with broken necks in his hands. The guardian knights were so surprised that their eyes popped out when they saw that it was the infamous poisonous bloody mamba from the Red and Black Mountain. Even though it was a snake with its fangs removed, it was still a huge disaster for such a monster to be discovered in the nursery. Within a few minutes, this news reached Hugo, who was in the main castle, and he rushed straight to the castle. Afterwards, all nannies who worked the night shift were executed after torture, and a very strict guard was placed in the nursery. The culprit who released the poisonous snake was never found. But only one person. A young hunting dog who could only speak could see through all the truth. A legendary child who, since birth, crossed the cradle of swords in the shortest amount of time, dived into the river Styx for the longest time, and not only that, he strangled two poisonous snakes in his cradle. Vikir van Baskerville. He just lies quietly in his cradle and waits for his time. A moment to repay the debt, a time for revenge. And eight years have passed since then. Episode 4 The Hound of the Baskervilles, 1. Eight years have passed. Vikir van Baskerville was eight years old and, like all Baskerville children, was receiving various classes. The tutor asked. Okay, last question. How did you say you can distinguish the level of a swordsman? Vikir answered with a calm expression. Regardless of swordsmanship skill, a swordsman who does not know how to load mana into the sword is a sword beginner, and a swordsman who knows how to load mana onto the tip of a sword, but whose aura is as weak as gas, is called a sword expert. The state where the aura rising from the sword becomes sticky and dense like a liquid is called sword graduator, and the state where the aura not only becomes solid like a solid but can change its shape according to the caster's will is called sword master. Of course, all of these are separated for convenience. Basically, combat is affected by numerous factors such as health, terrain, climate, humidity, gravity, experience points, and the density of mana in the atmosphere. You can calculate it, but the results will already be different when you do it. However, eight-year-old children's calculations are not yet that complicated. As Vikir answered without hesitation, the other children around him raised their hands and shouted as if competing. If a beginner and an expert fight, the expert wins. If there is a fight between an expert and a graduate, the graduate wins. Master is stronger than graduate. And the matriarch is the master. Bikir was silently listening to the children around him. The words of one of the guys pierce my heart. The head of the family is the master. Hugo Les Baskerville, head of the Baskervilles. He has as much as seven circles of mana, which is equivalent to a wizard. However, as a master of swordsmanship, he converted mana into aura and used it on his sword, 
and his level is said to be on par with that of a sword master whom the world admires. The tutor said. Great. Hugo, the eldest of the Baskerville family, is a sword master. This is a level that only seven people have reached in this country, and the heads of each of the seven great families fall into this category. Of course, Vicure already knew this. He even already knew that there were several more powerful sword masters inside and outside the empire. This is information that no one knows at this point. Vikir is thinking about something alone. The tutor's gaze had been focused on Vikir from a while ago. He is a great person. A talent that is truly overwhelming, almost bordering on violence at this point. It has become a small legend in the family that a child who was only 100 days old dived in the river Styx for more than seven minutes. But is it just the body that excels? Although he was overshadowed by his extraordinary body, his brain was also so brilliant that there was no rival among his peers in the family. It can be said that, if you teach one thing, you can enlighten a hundred. I think the head of the family will be happy today as well. He was going to report all this to Hugo. Hugo is not really interested in the rest of his children unless they are his eldest or second son. Hugo, who acted as if he were just a livestock wholesaler, stopping by occasionally to record the growth and value of livestock, has become increasingly interested in Yu Song over the past few years. Of course it's because of Vikir. It was extremely unusual for Hugo to come to this infant castle, a place where only children under the age of 10 were raised and shared, so the tutors in charge of this place had a lot of weight on their shoulders these days. Thank you, master. I will assist you with all my might. Thanks to Vikir, the budget increased significantly and his position increased compared to other knights in the family, so everyone was looking at Vikir with favorable eyes. Of course, Vikir himself was not interested. After class was over, the children were returning to their respective rooms throughout the castle. Vikir was currently looking at himself. Hugo is a master, right? Unfortunately, that's true. The density and rigidity were completely different from the solid aura that only a master could manifest, and the sticky liquid aura of his own as a senior graduate. Wow. My teeth suddenly grind together. In this life, I will never live or die so miserable. At least before the coming of age ceremony, I will recover all my strength. Currently eight years old. Bikir's level had reached the upper level of sword expert without anyone knowing. In my previous life, it was a level I could only reach after I turned twenty. Before he regressed, he reached the upper level of sword expert at the age of a certain age. In fact, this alone was great enough to be considered an unexalted genius by world standards, but within the Baskervilles, he was ordinary, or slightly below that level. Usually, children from the Baskerville family knock on the door of advanced sword experts around the age of twenty and graduates around the age of thirty. If you can put liquid aura on the tip of your sword in this way, you can move up to the position of executive, and if not, you will move from one level to the next. The elite of the Baskerville family, who are said to be geniuses among geniuses, reached the threshold of becoming a sword expert by reaching the age of twenty. But Vikir was doing it now at the age of eight. At an age when I had never even felt mana in my previous life. This is a level that even the super elite within the family cannot dare to reach. When Vikir was feeling a new emotion. Hey! I heard a voice calling from behind. I turned my head to see something, and saw three children in my nine-year-old class. High bro less Baskervilles, middle bro less Baskervilles, low bro less Baskervilles. The surname Lu is given to boys in direct lineage, and the surname La is given to girls. So the three here are direct descendants of the Baskervilles. Very clear lineage. In a very cliched way, the eldest child, Hybro, who was in front, started arguing with Vikir. Semi, trash, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? If the guy in front sings the first song, the two guys in the back sing the chorus. It was truly a fight worthy of a nine-year-old. Well, anyway, the Baskervilles are strictly based on talent and merit, so things like this won't happen until you get a little older. However, there was another reason why Vikir was keeping a close eye on the triplets in front of him. The trident of Hugo Baskerville. In just ten more years, they will grow into quite a troublesome enemy. In fact, before returning, 
these are the three hunting dogs who viciously chased and stabbed Vakir as he escaped through the siege. If you think about it, these guys have been tormenting me a lot since I was young. Because they deprived him of his school lunch, Vakir's growth rate was very slow during his childhood. During various evaluations, he showed a lot of vicious behavior, such as sneakily tripping or swinging a blind knife. As a result, I became slightly limp, and there were many times when I almost died on various missions. Flash A flash of blood leaked from Bakir's eyes. Whether they knew it or not, the triplets, who had just turned nine, giggled and surrounded Bakir. Hey scum, I heard you dived in the river sticks for seven minutes. And you strangled two poisonous snakes in the cradle. Stop bluffing. How can someone who is only eight years old lie? Lie. Lie. Hi bro, the most vicious of the three, took a step forward. Can you do this? At the same time, a small sphere glows faintly above his palm. The young children of the Baskervilles are exceptional in their mana sensitivity and operational ability. It is already possible to condense mana and gather it into a circle. It seemed like he couldn't put it on a sword yet, but it was still a skill that deserved to be praised as a genius in the world. Of course, even within the Baskervilles, he can be praised for being quite talented. When it comes to talent, this is talent. Hurry up and try it too. Let's see how much mana you can make. Look. Look. The triplets continued to urge Vakir. Vakir looked at the fluffy lump of mana created by Lobro. A mana sphere the size of a child's fist. Yes, at that age, I did pretty well at that level. But Vakir had already done that much in just eight months after being born. When he strangled two poisonous snakes in his cradle. Since eight years of mana proficiency has been added to the thirty years before the regression, where does it reach? Vakir took a look around. There is not much to worry about in this little Fong castle where only children live. The few guardian knights and tutors are all currently out towards the outer castle. Pot. Vakir unleashed his power. Vikir raises his palms high and collects mana. The expressions of the triplets who saw this were filled with astonishment. Nothing was created on Vikir's palm. The triplets looked blank for a moment, but then began to laugh loudly. Ahahahaha, you Byongsen. Is it possible that you couldn't even sense mana at that age? You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. The guys are so busy mocking him that they even shed tears. But. At the same time, a watchtower not far from Yusong. One of the guardian knights on guard duty was embarrassed by the unexpected event seen outside the window. W what is it? Why are there two sons on Yua Castle? Episode 5 The Dogs of the Baskervilles, 2 I don't like you. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. The Baskervilles nine-year-old triplets, high bro, middle bro, and low bro, were having a low-level argument. Eight-year-old Vakir thought with his mouth closed. In my childhood before my return, meeting these guys was as scary as meeting the Shinigami. These guys were also involved in the death that occurred decades later due to a landslide. Above all, these are warriors who will be so outstanding that in the next ten years they will be called, Baskerville's Trident or, Hugo Baskerville's Trident. Aren't they dreamers who will make many great contributions to the Baskerville family? So it was necessary to nip it in the bud in advance. In order to eat up this Baskerville family in the future. Hee <laughs> hee. I'm scared, my brothers. Is this how you do it? Vikir looked at me, crying like a helpless child. And then he spoke to the triplets who were very excited. Wouldn't it be better to go to a place where no one is around and hit me? Then the triplets giggled. At least I know what honor is. Ah yes. Ah yes. Being beaten in a place where many people are watching is a bothersome thing even for triplets. They break Vikir's arms, cover his mouth, and drag him to a dark place. Young Fong Castle was a castle that had been built a long time ago, and as it is a building that follows the old architectural style, there are many remote and nooks and crannies here and there. Cross the flooded basement entrance, pass through abandoned food warehouses and unrepaired cracks, and climb up the spiral stairs. The triplets took Vakir to a secluded room in an unused hallway. Hi bro, the leader, said with a smile. 
If you scream, something might get cut off. Well, if you go to the nurse's office on time, you can put it on. I can put it on. I can put it on. Looking at the little girl smiling darkly while pulling out a dagger from her waist, I can't believe that she is nine years old. Are they saying that young children are more cruel? Children laugh and kill insects by removing their heads or wings and stomping on them. Ordinary children might be like this, but it goes without saying that the children of the Baskervilles are like this. These three small devils surrounded Vikir and spoke. I heard you dived in the river Styx for seven minutes. I laughed for a while after hearing that brag from my nanny. I laughed. I laughed. High bro gestured to the youngest low bro next to him. Low bro then grinned and nodded, then went behind Vikir and covered Vikir's nose and mouth with both hands. High bro looked at Vikir's face and laughed evilly. What about seven minutes? Even if you can last just three minutes, I'll hold the bag in my hands. I will support you. I will support you. Low bro applies even more force to the hand covering Bakir's nose and mouth. I could sense innocent malice in the two hands that were tightly closed, as if they were not going to allow even a single breath of air. High bro and middle bro are smiling brightly, holding both arms tightly, with the intention of suppressing Bakir if he moves. But. The triplets turn their heads with a puzzled expression. Because Vikir was standing still, not moving at all, looking at the triplets. He he he, are you going to give it a try? You have quite a bit of spirit. Let's see how far we go. Let's see. Let's see. The triplets tighten their hands even more. A minute passed like that. Since I haven't even raised my mana, I'm starting to feel out of breath as a child. But Vikir just stands there with calm eyes, just like before. You're holding up pretty well, kid. You bastard. You bastard. The triplets were busy giving strength to their hands, not even noticing that the smiles on their faces were slowly fading away. And it was over two minutes. The triplets have become less talkative. The time surrounding Bakir, who was standing still, began to feel like it had been too long. What is this guy? Aren't you breathing? No. No. When high bro becomes suspicious, low bro jumps and shakes his head. It was clearly blocking his breathing. And three minutes. Four minutes. Five minutes. Six minutes. Seven minutes. Eight minutes. Nine minutes. Ten minutes. Bakir still stands motionless. Meanwhile, there was only an eerie silence in the room. At this point, the backs of the triplets, who were the bullies, were covered in cold sweat. It may sound like ten minutes, but if you actually feel it and count from one to six hundred in your head, you will realize that it is an incredibly long time. Meanwhile, Bakir was staring at the triplets with a very calm attitude, blinking. With grave-like silence. Yet. High bro smiled and gestured to low bro. Jay, it's not fun. Free this bastard. Release me. Release me. The moment Lobro was about to take his hand off Fakir's mouth. Aya. A sudden noise erupts. It was not the sound of Fakir gasping for breath or struggling. Blood was gushing out of Lobro's index finger. Tisk. Fakir chewed what was in his mouth a few times before spitting it out. And then he smiled at the triplets in front of him. I heard you got a sore on your finger. Vikir is smiling brightly with a lot of thick blood on the corner of his mouth. When the triplets saw that, their complexions turned pale for an instant. Finally, Hybro shouted as if he was chewing. Joy. That's right, huh, I'm not scared at all. I'm not scared. Scared. The last comment was crooked. As high bro and middle bro turn their heads, low bro raises his palm and whimpers. I cut off my finger. The triplets' conversation began to become disjointed. Seeing blood is a familiar thing to the Baskerville children. However, the story is a little different when, beyond the blood, the torn flesh, broken bones, and even all of those things are one's own. The guys who always moved together and in the same direction like a trident started playing separately. The eldest, high bro, comforts the youngest, low bro. 
Calm down bro. Let's quickly go to the nurse's office and ask the priest to attach the finger. Let's do it. Oh okay. Quickly. Middle bro carried low bro on his back. When high bro quickly reached out and tried to open the door. Who said it was okay to go? Vikir blocked his path. High bro's expression became grimly distorted. You are. Of course, the distorted expression never straightened out again. Wag jag. This is because Vikir's fist flew in and broke all of his nose and teeth. High bro lying on the floor holding his face. Pop. Middle bro, who was standing there with a blank expression, was knocked back by Vikir's kick that immediately followed. What? Ugh dash. Sobbing. All three triplets screaming, moaning, and crying with different sounds. Vikir quietly sat down in front of the door and said. I will be unwell for the rest of my life. If I don't get proper treatment within the next hour. But looking at my brother's behavior, it looks like he won't be able to leave this room today. Whenever it rains and your teeth, jaw, or fingers ache, always remember this day. Then the triplets glared at Bakir as if they were going to kill him. The cruel nature cultivated in the Baskervilles over the past nine years is not going anywhere. But they are still children. Bakir grinned. There is no such thing as being beaten and disobeyed. If there is someone who doesn't listen to what you say, you should think about whether you should be less of a fan. This was Hugo Baskerville's view of childcare, and furthermore, the code of conduct for the entire Baskerville family. Ugh. Fortunately, the eldest brother, Hybro, gathers courage and attacks again. With a dagger in his hand. But. Puck. Even though Hybro's dagger pierced straight into Vakir's body, it failed to draw out a single drop of blood. Uh. Hybro makes a blank expression. Vikir's chest seemed to turn black when it touched the dagger, but soon returned to its flesh color. God bless the river sticks. Vikir's body reached the state of complete sword invulnerability at just eight years old. Sigh. A similar sound to when the dagger was inserted earlier. But the results are completely different. Hybro sat down as he felt that all of his remaining teeth were completely broken. It happened in just two punches. Whooping whooping gar. The sound of tears, snot, saliva, blood, air bubbles, and teeth mixing together in the mouth. Vikir's dark shadow is cast in front of the triplets, who are trembling and clutching their faces, chins, and fingers. Landing. A dagger thrown into the middle of the triplets. But no one had thought to point it out. Everyone instinctively knows this. If you catch that, you'll get hit even harder. The triplets were kneeling on the floor, not daring to even raise their heads, just shedding blood, tears, saliva, and cold sweat. The crotches of all three were so wet that it seemed like they had even urinated. At that time, Vikir said, There is only one person who can get out of this room alive. The expressions of the triplets suddenly change as they discover a single strand of rope. Who? 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 Vikir's answer to that was simple. From now on, we have to decide between brothers and sons. At the same time, the triplet's eyes focused on the dagger in the center. Damn it! Baskerville's trident began to split from the inside. Episode 6 The Dogs of the Baskervilles, 3. John Barrymore. He is a butler who has been loyal to the Baskerville family for four generations. Matriarch. I will give you a daily report. And sitting in front of Barrymore is a middle-aged man with a cool-headed look. A sharp nose, a thick beard, and cold eyes. Sword Master, Sword Saint, Seven Pillars of National Salvation. Hugo Les Baskerville, the greatest of the iron-blooded swordsman Baskervilles, was looking at Barrymore with an expressionless face. This is the first report. About the bloody incident with the Morgue family that took place in the ruby mine of Red All Mountain. The Morgue family, famous for its magic, is one of the seven noble families along with the Baskerville family. The Baskerville family has recently been going through a territorial dispute with the Morgue family, and the lucrative ruby mine to the west, which lies subtly at the edge of each other's territory, was the area that was causing the problem. Finally, at the end of the long story, Hugo's mouth opened. 
we will have a chance to discuss that soon. I will come from the morgue side first. Hugo's hand continues. Barrymore continued to report while paying attention. Hugo listened to his report mostly with an indifferent expression and without much interest. The only response I got was to occasionally express my irritation by frowning. At that time, there were reports of Hugo showing a change in facial expression for the first time. So, the person who took first place in this midterm evaluation for Yu Ah Song is Master Vakir. After hearing Butler Barrymore's words, Hugo gently rubbed his chin. Barrymore knew that this was Hugo's habit when he was satisfied. Barrymore's expression brightened, as it was rare for Hugo to remember the name of a child in the family. Soon, Hugo asked. Butler. When is the practical test for children who entered the infant school? It won't be long. It starts in five days. Most of you Ah Song's guardian knights have already gone on business trips outside to make preparations. Then you Ah Song must have been empty. Barrymore's expression got a little excited at those words. Anyway, the next news I'll report to you is about you Ah Song, matriarch. Something. That, there are good things and there are bad things. Listen to the good things first. When Hugo showed interest, Barrymore's voice became a little stronger. It is said that a phenomenon occurred where two suns appeared in the sky above Yua Castle. There are two suns. Hugo's eyes widened slightly when he heard those words. I am quite a believer in the superstition of going to Baskerville. Is this an auspicious sign? First of all, two suns have risen, right? There is also a rumor among the Gasols that a little son has been born to assist the legitimate son. Hmm. I'm sure someone was playing around with mana, right? At the time, all those skilled enough to pull off such pranks were on a business trip preparing for the master's practical exam. Well, then it's not a bad sign. It's another son. Hugo nodded quietly. Originally, the rising of two suns, or clouds, was considered a good omen. When mother of pearl clouds appear, good things always happen to the family. I don't know what might happen in Yuah Song. Then Barrymore's expression darkened. That is something happened. Is this the bad news you mentioned earlier? Tell me. After hearing Hugo's words, Barrymore continued his report with a somber expression. There was a big fight between the masters. Hugo's expression changed completely at those words. Big fight? How many people died? No one died, but all of Master Highbrow's teeth were damaged, Master Middlebrow's jaw was caved in, and Master Lowbrow's right index finger was amputated. Of course, everyone has now received treatment and has regained his original health. Then it's a small quarrel. Brothers grow up by hitting and fighting with each other. Hugo leaned back in his chair again, as if relieved. Then he looked over the report on the triplets and muttered. Since we are so close to each other, there is no way we would have fought, right? You're right. There was friction with another master. These are foolish things. If you are older than yourself in this family, you will definitely be stronger. Even mere bastards will gauge whether you are stronger or weaker than them and attack you. When Hugo clicked his tongue, Barrymore corrected him. That, the master who made the high, middle, and low blow masters that way is younger. What? Younger than nine and a half years. So you're saying the whole class of eight-year-olds pounced? No. There is only one person. At those words, Li Chai appears again in Hugo's eyes. And Barrymore's subsequent report deepened the controversy. Master Vakir, who ranked first in the written test I mentioned earlier, was the perpetrator. Vakir Van Baskerville. Eight years old this year. He received a call from the head of the family and headed to the head's office, located deep in the main castle. As you open the door and enter, you can see the large figure of Hugo Les Baskerville. Sit down. Even though he did not display any particular aura, the energy radiating from him was heavy. Vikir moved carefully so as not to detect the mana hidden in his body. I'm confident about hiding my mana. The warriors who have gone through a long period of destruction and confrontation with demons have become adept at conserving their momentum. This method of completely hiding mana was something that warriors who had not experienced the era of destruction could not know even if they were dead or awake. 
this was a matter of skill rather than strength. However, that also has some limitations, so if you gain stronger power, you will inevitably catch Hugo's attention. I'll have to find a way to help myself sooner or later. Bikir sat down on the small chair in front of him, thinking about various things in his mind. Hugo opened his mouth. You've grown a lot while I haven't seen you. Bikir was a little surprised to hear that. His voice, which had always been sharpened like a blade and seemed like it would cut just by hearing it, is somehow quite dull today. And the line itself was interesting. Pigs are big and big, but why are they always so small and dirty every time I see them? This is what Hugo used to say all the time before returning to his childhood. He used to look at the growth of livestock and give them the gaze of a butcher who was impatient because he couldn't sell them quickly, but today he was giving me a strangely warm look. It was as if he was expecting something. Hello, matriarch. Vikir gave a bright greeting like a child. However, Hugo, who is called the head of the family, seems to be dissatisfied with something. Matriarch? Okay. He is the head of the family. He thought about something for a moment and then changed the subject as if he had decided. I heard that they maimed nine-year-old triplets in the upper class. I understand that his older brother received appropriate treatment afterward. I'm not talking about physical disability. Hugo frowned. Isn't your heart crippled? I heard that since that day, we eat separately, sleep separately, and do not speak to each other properly. The three of them were excellent at passing at the same time, but now they have completely fallen out. Is that all it is? These days, all three of them urinate just by making eye contact with each other. A dog that has lost its fighting spirit will be useless forever. But Vikir did not bother to say these words out loud. I just confidently state my convictions. Wouldn't it be heavy and useless to wear three shabby swords at once? It would be better to have a famous sword painstakingly forged by a craftsman. At those words, a bright smile appears in Hugo's eyes. That's right. He rubs his chin and looks down at the eight-year-old kid in front of him. This is a guy that makes the corners of your mouth itch when you look at him. But don't you think it was wrong to beat up your brothers? Vikir questioned Hugo's words as if he were puzzled. Wrong. What do I do? What? Didn't you make a mess of your brothers? In response to Hugo's question, Bakir tilted his head as if he couldn't understand. Why is that wrong? I'm stronger. What? Bakir lashed out at Hugo, who had a blank expression on his face. How can a strong person make a mistake? Strong self-respect. A world where weakness is sin. Isn't that the Baskervilles? Yet. The corner of Hugo Les Baskerville's mouth began to twitch. It's as if this small, bold guy in front of you is so cute that you'll die. Episode 7 The Dogs of the Baskervilles, 4 Vikir knows Hugo's personality well. Lizard Man A cold-blooded human with blood so cold that one might think of it as a reptile. Basically, he was only interested in the future of his family and his own inaction. A person who thinks of everyone but himself as a tool, especially a weapon. Weapons basically exist to harm others, and it is inconceivable for a weapon to grant or hesitate on its own. It is also natural that the more poison it contains, the better the weapon becomes. Therefore, it was quite possible that Hugo's gaze towards Bakir gradually became colored with happiness. Okay. Do you think you have no sin? Yes. Rather, it was the older brothers who were at fault. What did I do wrong? It's a weak fault. Strong self-respect. A world where weakness is sin. Isn't that the Baskervilles? Bakir's words accurately penetrated this core family motto of the Baskervilles. It is not a sin for a lion to kill and eat a deer. It is natural for the strong to beat up the weak, and claiming that it should be divided into crime and punishment is just foolishness for the weak. These were Hugo's teachings from his tutors, which were like nails in his ears during his childhood. So my brothers bullied me first. Even if you whine, it's no use. Before returning, Bakir explained his innocence and the sins of his brothers, as ordinary children do, but Hugo only expressed his contempt with an even more frowning expression. And those eyes were the same until the last moment when he was kneeling on the guillotine at the execution site. Meanwhile, 
Hugo Les Baskerville. He clasped his hands together and covered his mouth. And he spoke in a low voice. Your brothers came here before you. He said that, as an elder, he would generously forgive you. Bikir didn't bother to answer. This can be seen from the fact that he has had the experience of staying by Hugo's side for a long time. Perhaps the triplets, rather than giving Hugo a satisfactory answer, would have only irritated him. He must have been very intimidated. And what about forgiveness? It's obvious that he whined and begged to be isolated somehow, saying he had been treated badly. Vikir answered in a voice without much emotion. It's okay to eat for free. Hugo paused for a moment. Finally, Hugo lets out a faint laugh. He he he. That is correct. When my father became the head of the family, he also worked hard to become the eldest son. It was quite an unfamiliar sight to see Hugo calling himself father. By the way, are you trying to become a legitimate eldest son? Is that something that can be achieved by trying? Bikir, who was worried for a moment when he heard the sound for the first time, soon understood what it meant. Hugo ascended to the position of head of the family by killing all of his older brothers through the royal family. Right. I heard that the eldest son is the one who carries on the family line. Even the eldest son could become an acquired child. It was a moment when I once again realized the true nature of the Baskervilles. Hugo asked again. No matter what. My brothers were the first to reach out and say they would forgive you. Still, don't you feel guilty? Vikir looked at Hugo in silence for a moment. The warm gaze of my father that I had never received in my last life. However, a heart that is already salty and frozen can never be thawed by such feeble warmth. When was it before the regression? The last daughter of a family that was exterminated by the Baskervilles once visited Hugo in person. After some time passed, she became a nun and said a mass with the message, I forgive you. And Hugo, who heard the mass, said this. Isn't forgiveness just an excuse for the weak who have no power to take revenge? Except for the honorific, the line is exactly the same as Hugo's from back then. At that moment, Hugo's eyes opened wide. Ha 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 dash. Only then did a sound of laughter so loud that the windows tremble echoed through the room. Hugo leaned back in his chair with an extremely satisfied expression. This is how my child should be. It's like looking at the first one. It was the first time Bakir had seen him express his emotions to this extent towards his child. This was the end of the conversation with Hugo. Barrymore. Hugo, who had called the butler, had already returned with an expressionless face. However, the warmth of the fire still remains in the voice coming out of the mouth. Give Vikir the key to the food warehouse. Barrymore's eyes widened when she heard those words. Children in the Baskervilles always eat the same food until they are fifteen years old. Water and haggis. It is a dough made by mashing together all kinds of animal meat, internal organs, and some vegetables. It boasts extreme calories and nutritional value, but is extremely tasteless and salty. The food is provided in unlimited quantities and is managed very hygienically, but there is no taste at all. Therefore, the young children of the Baskervilles are crazy about the snacks, candies, and chocolate that are sometimes given to them when they achieve excellent grades in basic education. It is a system that can inspire young children's desire to learn, foster a sense of competition, and further develop them into great members of Baskerville at a very low price. Knowing that, Hugo asked Vikir. Do you have any snacks you want to eat? Then Vikir responded quickly with an innocent smile typical of an eight-year-old child. Chocolate. Hugo looked at that and nodded. You're probably thinking, she's cute enough for her age. Barrymore also smiles happily as if a child is still a child. Hugo gestured to Barrymore. Go to the food pantry and get as much chocolate as you want. However, don't be too greedy. Just enough to carry. Yes, matriarch. Barrymore took Vakir's hand and headed for the door. At that time. Hugo said, turning his back to the door. Take a good look at this mid-term evaluation. It is unusual to receive this kind of encouragement. But what followed was even more unusual. Don't be defeated by your immediate superiors. At those words, Vikir's eyes began to emit red light. 
like two sons. Here we go, master. Barrymore took the kier to a kitchen on the outskirts of Yusung. Several chefs followed behind, politely observing. Food warehouses deep underground are always cool. The cold air gushing out between the cracks in the stone met the warm air that came in when the door was opened, creating condensation. Barrymore held up a lamp and illuminated the inside of the warehouse. It can be done by using mana, but it is not necessary to embarrass the old butler by doing it this way. Vikir went inside. The ingredients eaten by the family's guardian knights, family members over the age of 15, and other employees can be seen arranged neatly. Candies and jellies are here. If there is a menu you would like to cook and eat separately, I will ask the chefs to prepare it. Bikir shook his head at Barrymore's gentle invitation. Just chocolate will do. At those words, Barrymore looked down at Bikir with slightly sad eyes. Oh my god, I wish I could eat so much chocolate. If you are over the age of 15, you will be able to eat whatever you want. It was a sincere consolation. The chefs behind them took out the highest quality chocolates from the shelves while watching the butler. This is the highest quality chocolate that the ladies of the House of Morgue, famous for their gourmet food, enjoy eating. This time we also got a few copies. It is said that the flavor becomes more intense if you add southern nuts and western honey. But Vikir shook his head. I don't need anything processed. Yes. Vikir opened his mouth to Barrymore and the chefs who had a puzzled look on their faces. I need cacao beans. A species with a very rich flavor. Barrymore, who heard those words, tilted her head. The raw material for chocolate is cacao beans. However, unprocessed cacao beans are bitter and astringent rather than sweet. Even if it was a species with a strong flavor, it was clear that it would only taste bitter. After a while, Barrymore spoke after hearing the chef's reports. Um. If it is a species with a strong flavor they say it does exist. In the past, the head of the family personally led the senators within the family to subdue the barbarians on the western front of the territory and cultivate the vast jungle in the area into farmland. It is said that a single bean called, bloody bean, a local specialty, can make 100 liters of chocolate. Good. Bring it. How much should I bring? As is. The chefs moved at Vikir's command. Soon, a chef came with a small leather pouch in his hand. The pocket, barely big enough to fit two fists, was filled with bright red beans. As a rough estimate, it seems to be over 100 grains. This is bloody bean. It is said that one bean has a consistency comparable to 100 liters of chocolate. Vikir chewed a bean as a test. Crack. The reaction comes immediately in the mouth. It was so astringent and bitter that it made my entire tongue tingle. Vikir spat out the beans and nodded in satisfaction. Barrymore nodded. You really like chocolate a lot. Anyway, Hugo told Vikir to give him as much food as he wanted as long as he could carry it, so there would be no problem if he took all of these cacao beans. However, this one bag of cacao beans is enough to produce 10,000 liters of chocolate. Barrymore admired the eight-year-old's greed and wisdom. Maybe Vikir will be able to eat as much of his favorite chocolate as he can for the rest of his life. Young master. Would you like me to process this and bring it up to your room? However. Vikir gave an answer that made everyone look puzzled. There is no need for processing. It's enough like this. It looks like he didn't get it to eat. Episode 8 Hounds of Hell, 1. Baskerville children take midterm and final assessments twice a year until they turn 15. In order to get rid of the stigma of being from a berserker family, they tend to make the usual general education classes very rigorous. The reason they are called the berserker family in the first place is because of the extremely difficult practical exam. It was not something that children who had just turned 8 or 9 could avoid. Children at the Baskervilles receive thorough early education. From the moment they are able to walk on two feet, they are made to continuously run around the vast training grounds and steep hills to develop their basic physical strength. You cannot lie down or face down outside of the designated time. The guardian knights become instructors and trained like crazy. During his free time, he plays with a rubber knife, and when he sleeps, he places it next to the corpse of a large monster or the baby of a very small monster. 
this is to get them used to the hideous appearance and vicious nature of their prey. And from the age of eight, full-scale training begins. The meal changes. In a broth made by boiling chicken bones, various meaty meats are added and boiled until they become porridge. Then, put it in the tough internal organs and boil it again to remove the last of the fat. Haggis is a regular meal to be eaten right away at this stage. Here, it is salted for storage, and after a long period of time, it dries and hardens into beef jerky, which is the preserved food that the Baskerville children always carry with them. Today, each of the Baskerville's eight- or nine-year-old children was sent to the mountains on the outskirts of the territory with a bag of these jerky. Le Rouge et le Noir Mountain This is an alpine area with a truly harsh environment, inhabited only by a few vicious types of monsters, and the climate, terrain, and ecosystem are all barren. The Baskerville's young hunting dogs are thrown here and have to survive for about a month. Of course, they only live within the restricted area, and the family's guardian knights, called leading dogs, are stationed at the boundaries of the restricted area. The tasks of children thrown into an unfamiliar environment are as follows. Survive, if possible, hunt big and strong monsters. The original task was simply to survive, but the current head of the family, Hugo Les Baskerville, said this task was too easy and added a second task. This is because sometimes, among the children of the Baskervilles, there were children who stayed in safe caves or tunnels and survived by eating only beef jerky. A child who bravely fought a monster and survived and a child who was thrown into a cave like a coward and ate nothing but food should not be evaluated the same way. This was Hugo's idea. Minus 10 points if you succeed in saving your life. Minus 30 points if you succeed in saving your life without being maimed. Minus 50 points if you survive and fail other children. Minus 70 points if you catch the monster and survive. Minus 90 points if you succeed in saving your life without being maimed despite failing other children or surviving by catching a monster. There is number 100 points. The moment a swordsman becomes conceited, he dies. That's Hugo's guideline. Of course, if you die in any situation, you get zero points. The least valuable of all deaths, dog death itself. Eight-year-old Vikir arrived here at the Red and Black Mountains today. When I got off the carriage, I saw piles of red dirt. Black ants were swarming on the pile of dried earth. A dry wind blows through the burned dead trees. All I see is red and black things. The Guardian Knight said. I would have handed out badges to each and every one of you. As soon as you leave this place, take each other's badges. If you steal the other person's badge, you will receive additional points. Even if you hunt monsters, you will receive additional points. However, points will be deducted if you receive fatal injuries. In case of death, all points are lost. Well, the score is no longer an issue at the time of death. It is not recommended to go outside the restricted area. You must only move within the space we have conquered over the past few days. The Red and Black Mountains here are home to many unexplored and unexplored areas. The Guardian Knights explained other minor rules. But to Vikir, it's just an annoying nag. It's been a while since I've been here. He also visited the Red and Black Mountains often. This is the Red and Black Mountain where I often came and went as a test taker when I was young, and as an instructor when I got older. It was an unfamiliar and scary place when I was a test taker, but when I came as an instructor. It's an even scarier and stranger place. This is because the search had to go outside the safe zone. The area where the Baskerville's infant struggled to survive is, in fact, almost like a cozy cradle. The truly dangerous place is the area outside the perimeter guarded by guardian night instructors. No harm zone. Outside the ridge called the Cradle, beyond several mountain ranges, there are powerful monsters and barbarians swarming. Since the Baskerville family declared this place as their territory, they have been steadily exploring beyond the Red and Black Mountains. It was also because of the Emperor's orders and full support. The expansion of the Baskerville family's territory meant expansion of the Empire's territory, and for this purpose, various tax benefits and autonomy of military facilities were guaranteed. Before returning, Vikir has also spent a very long time here in the Red and Black Mountains, having spent his days as an examinee, instructor, and hunting dog. So the environment here was very familiar and familiar. 
It goes without saying that it was not in the no sea zone, beyond the ridge, but in the cradle. But. Most children seem to feel unfamiliar and fearful of environments they see for the first time. A cliff of dry, crumbling dirt, a spicy wind blowing from a burned out forest, dry, rotting ash, and eerie looks and cries that can be felt from somewhere. Ugh, I've never been in such a bad place. It has become more barren than when I came last year. Stay here for a month. Eight year olds cry. The nine year olds were pretending to be calm, but their expressions were not good, perhaps because of bad memories from last year. In fact, this test is a fight between eight year olds trying to protect their badges and nine year olds trying to take them away. This experience will be very important for the current eight year old children, who will turn nine next year. And in this situation, eight year old Vakir stands still and waits for the bell to signal the start of the exam. Around them, nine-year-old children were smiling darkly, aiming for Vakir's badge. Is that you bastard? Dive for seven minutes in the river Styx. Does that make sense? Well, there is a rumor that he strangled two poisonous snakes while he was in the cradle. They say he's the one who got the perfect score on the written test. Let's see if you're good at practical skills. A murmur of noise all around. But there is one strange thing. Why are the high bro, middle bro, and low bro triplets, who are the strongest and fiercest in the nine-year-old's class, so quiet? The other nine-year-olds just tilted their heads, as they were always threatening to show Vakir an example. Soon, some of the children who were paying attention came forward and started arguing with Vakir. You cocky bastard. I will stone you to death as soon as the practical evaluation begins. Someone who isn't that great is proud of himself. You're going to feel like hell here for the next month. Then Vikir finally responded. I don't think I'm great. It's not really that great. Children as young as nine make puzzled looks at the unexpected humility. However, Vikir's next words immediately made the guys' faces frown. You guys are just way too low. Immediately after that, a bunch of fresh swear words flew out and hit me. You, I am the real jangle. When evening comes, come to the old tree, you bastard. Everyone get out of the way. I will beat up that bastard. Even if I die, I won't know. The children of the Baskervilles are easily swayed by even low-level provocations. The one-day puppies, who had not even been weaned yet, were showing their canine teeth that had not yet matured. As an old dog that has been through all sorts of hardships, I can't even smile, so I'm just indifferent. Right then. Ding. Pavlov Van Baskerville, a guardian knight and instructor in charge of the leading dog role, rang the bell. The practical exam has begun. Episode 9 Hounds of Hell, 2. In the Baskervilles, practical exams are held frequently, several times a day. In most cases, brothers fight each other to determine superiority or inferiority in strength, and the start of a fight is usually announced with this bell. Ding. The Baskerville's young hunting dogs, who were nervous in an unfamiliar environment, immediately came to their senses at the sound of a familiar bell. And as it has been learned, speculation is revealed as an instinct. One of the little Baskervilles in the nine-year-old class quickly ran across the moor. Last year, this guy gained quite a bit of advantage by first occupying the advantageous terrain here. However, although he had the intelligence to remember last year's points, he did not have the intelligence to keep in mind the attention focused on him. The quick-witted eight-year-olds chase after him. I don't know what it is, but I'm planning to intercept what he's trying to get. Smart guys pretend to know something and go forward pretending to know something to attract competitors. And they lured them into dangerous pits and swamps and eliminated all the annoying flies that stuck to them all at once. The high bro, middle bro, and low bro triplets were those cunning guys. Occupy from there. Don't give orders. I'm doing well on my own, so you guys should take care of it. These nine-year-olds are already standing out. For reference, these guys used a similar method last year when they were eight years old, eliminating a bunch of upperclassmen a year older than them. Within a few hours after the bell rang, eliminations began to appear one after another. Fainting from shock, falling down a steep slope, falling into a swamp, or getting stabbed or cut by something sharp. The reasons were varied, but the fundamental cause was one. 
it was suffered at the hands of other brothers. Kong. The sound of metal pieces hitting each other can be heard throughout the forest. As soon as the competition began, the young children of the Baskerville family were fighting each other with the short swords they were given. A dull knife with no edge that makes it impossible to kill. Killing your opponent is not recommended in this competition. It's not something that's banned, it's just something that's not recommended. If you kill your opponent, points are deducted since this score range was quite large, the children did their best not to kill their opponents by hand if possible. Of course, it doesn't matter if your skills are good enough to take a point deduction and you have enough accumulated points, or if you can kill the opponent secretly without being noticed by the guide dogs. Well, despite the fact that the guardian knights who act as guide dogs keep their eyes on 24 hours a day, mysterious or accidental deaths occur frequently, so this may be an opportunity to get rid of a rival or a guy you don't like to see. But. In this fierce competition, Bakir was not there. From the beginning, Bakir acted as if he had no interest in scoring points. All he did was to nimbly leave the protected area as soon as the bell rang and settle down in the wilderness on the outskirts of the border bordering the no-harvest zone. Was it like this? Bakir was reminiscing about his days as a test taker and instructor before returning. If you go straight this way, there is a wasteland that is just barely within the border area. There, a withered old tree stands tall, and the roots extending deep into the ground have rotted to a mushy state, making the entire ground soft. Eventually, Bakir found the land he was aiming for. The soil there is unusually redder than other places. Bakir broke a branch and began digging and digging into the ground. While the other brothers were fighting in the distance, winning and losing points, Bakir dug in silence. The guide dog guardian knights hid in a secret place and continued to observe Bakir. But even after a few days, Bakir could only be seen continuing to dig holes. I guess they're just hiding there to kill time. I'm a little disappointed. There's no need to keep watching. Since Bakir had been a standout since childhood, the guardian knights had high expectations, but this was quite disappointing. This is because digging holes and hiding was a typical behavior of cowards and low-class children. In the end, the guardian knights who were unable to watch began to take their eyes off Fakir one by one. But. They were too focused on the children fighting among themselves to watch. How deep does Fakir, who is only eight years old, dig a hole, and what does he do in it? This place is still like a cradle. Fakir. He was sitting at the bottom of the pit and was having some leisurely time. The red and black mountains, where I came again, were such a comfortable and cozy place. Guardian knights stand guard outside, and competitors do not come to these outskirts. If you are thirsty, you can collect the dew that has formed overnight on large leaves hanging on the wall of the pit, and if you are hungry, you can catch a passing snake or mole and roast it. In fact, it was much more delicious than the haggis or preserved food served in Yu Song school lunch. The bed I made myself was also more comfortable. Yuha Song's child's bed is made of monster bark or thorns, so it is very hard and rough. However, the pit here is now covered with well-dried straw, sawdust, and burnt ash, making it very warm and comfortable. Bakir closed his eyes for a moment as he roasted a rat he had caught the previous evening over a bonfire. Gutter Rat Norvegicus Risk Level, F Size, 50 cm Discovery Location, All Continents a rat that has become hideous due to demonic energy. Full-grown adults have the intelligence and size of a small dog, making them an object of disgust for women and girls. If you remove the intestines and grill it over a fire or boil it well in water, it is surprisingly edible. I clearly remember all information about monsters, no matter how low-level they are. It's thanks to the monster encyclopedia that I memorized before returning. Of course, in the world before the return, Bakir was not the only one who memorized all the monster encyclopedias. Because in the era of destruction, everyone was a hunter. But now I'm the only hunter. Maybe it's closer to a hunter's hunting dog. But that can actually make hunters more miserable. What could be more ironic than a hunter dying after being bitten in the neck by his own dog? Suddenly, I remember the conversation I had with Hugo before returning. This was not long before he was executed. When you train a dog, you have to risk dying. Usually two out of three die. Do you think it's heartless? 
No. Of course not. Because the owner trains the dog with the readiness to die from being bitten by the dog. The owner must also always be trained. You never know when he might die from being bitten by blind teeth. This is a fact that Hugo himself was aware of. Maybe that's why Hugo didn't trust anyone in this world. Even he himself. The Kier shook his head and erased any random thoughts. Then he took out a bean from the bag hanging on his belt. Blood bean. Dark red soybeans with a huge cacao concentration. The Kier threw a bean into the bonfire. The plump, fatty rat meat is free of odors and unpleasant odors, and the faint scent of cacao permeates it. Cacao beans, especially blood beans with a high concentration, are the best for removing meat odor. It was a recipe I learned from a late year sergeant in the same platoon when I was sent to the war against demons. Camping out makes me think about the past a lot. Vikir looked around. All the watching eyes have now disappeared. Perhaps the spirit dogs who found their behavior uninteresting moved to another place. If so, now is the time. Vikir reached for the large pile of firewood. Then he took out the dagger from his belt and started chopping down the trees. Throat Spear Vikir began planting these pointed wooden spears upside down all over the bottom of the pit. Spears soaring high into the sky. They are stuck in the bottom of the pit, dozens or hundreds of them. Like the lower jaw of a wild beast with sharp fangs. Vikir himself had not yet thought about what these teeth would bite into. Outside the border area between the Red and Black Mountains, in the Vano Sea Zone, there are monsters so large and powerful that modern humans cannot even imagine. Well, most of these are familiar to Vikir, who has lived through the Age of Destruction. The tree fell. Vikir discovered that all the trees he had cut down had been used up. There isn't enough to sharpen a wooden spear or throw into a bonfire. Vikir moved out of the pit to retrieve the wood. Now that the gaze of the guardian knights has disappeared, we can go over to the no harvest zone and cut down the tree. Soon, Vikir secretly crossed the border and entered the US sea ban zone. The sea of red and black water is incredibly dense. The stems and roots growing horizontally and vertically were turning the entire forest into a huge labyrinth, a jungle gym. Looking at the dark tunnels between the roots of trees burned dead by forest fires, one wonders if they are passages leading to hell. Normal young Baskerville hounds would avoid this gloomy and ominous place without being told, but Vakir digs into this hole on his own. Let's see. I guess this was roughly the habitat. Vakir wandered through the flood waters for a long time. When I was an instructor or a scout, I walked around here as if I were eating, so I can see the streets as clearly as if I were going in and out of my own home. Yet. Vikir discovered something. Sizzling sizzling. It is the sound of a fire buried in ashes burning. I followed the burning smell and eventually found what I was looking for. It was a pile of shit. A fire that has not yet been extinguished burns in the black pile of charred dung. As far as Vikir knows, there is only one monster that can poop this hot. I raised my head and crawled a little further through the tree's root tunnel, and eventually I saw the owner of the poop. A large body, sharp teeth and claws, and two eyes that glow like phosphorus. Hellhound. Risk grade, B+. Size, 3M. Location of discovery, Red and Black Mountains Part 2 Ridge. A.K.A. The Dog That Drives Hell. It is an entity that inevitably brings terrible disaster to anyone who encounters it, and once bitten, there is absolutely no way to survive. The sulfur fire that spews out from the eyes and mouth is brought from the depths of the polar hell and does not go out until the life used as firewood is completely burned away. There wasn't much information about this dangerous monster in the encyclopedia. However, Bakir has faced quite a few of these types of monsters throughout the Age of Destruction. I finally found it. The reason I came to Red and Black Mountain was to meet these guys. Vikir quickly turned around. As soon as the hellhound saw Vikir, it rushed at her. Wow! 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 The roar of a hunting dog following closely behind. At that moment, Vikir threw himself into a cave on the side of the flood. Sigh! The hellhound was unable to overcome the force of its fierce running in a straight line and took several vain steps. 
As expected, you're an idiot who only knows how to go straight. Most beings who climb up from hell can only go straight. Even elite monsters like hellhounds are weak against sudden bending patterns like this. Growling. The hellhound turned again and began to chase. Vikir prepared the next pattern. Wow. Drinking water made by collecting two drops of dew was sprinkled and drew a long line on the floor. Flinch. The hellhound came to a sudden stop just as it had been running. This oil species monster is unique in that it cannot cross water. This is true no matter how thin and shallow the water is. Since it is a monster that is not good at anything other than running in a straight line, it is a hellhound that goes back to the water marks scattered on the floor. Although this is a fact known to all hunters who have lived through the age of destruction, it is a habit that is not well known in today's world due to a lack of research. Well, it will inevitably be revealed later when the demon gate opens and hellhounds swarm the entire continent. Vikir turned to face the hellhound. Although the momentum of the hellhound running back around the water trail has slowed down, it is still fearsome. Well, hellhound is a monster that even knights of expert intermediate or higher have a hard time fighting one colon one with. Before returning, Bakir was also a powerful monster that I was able to defeat on my own when I was around 18 years old. But. Bakir did not come here without any plan. Canine monsters always open their mouths when they run. As an experienced hunter who has lived through an era of destruction, he took out a secret weapon prepared for this situation. The most effective weapon for catching canine monsters. Crack. The sound of peas hitting each other in one's hands. Blood bean cacao beans. It was chocolate. Episode 10 Hound of Hell, 3. Vikir recalled the past. It wasn't that long ago, it just happened a few days ago. It's similar to the award given to Hugo Baskerville for taking first place in the written exam. Do you have any snacks you want to eat? Chocolate. Butler. Go to the food warehouse and get as much chocolate as you want. However, don't be too greedy. Just enough to carry. At that time, Bakir had been given the keys to the food warehouse. In the basement where he followed Butler Barrymore, Bakir obtained a bag of chocolate beans. In the past, the head of the family personally led the senators within the family to subdue the barbarians on the western front of the territory and cultivate the vast jungle in the area into farmland. It is said that a single bean called Bloody Bean, a local specialty, can make 100 liters of chocolate. Bloody Bean A magical coffee bean with such a rich flavor that one bean can produce 100 liters of chocolate. Bakir took out a blood bean from the bag he wore on his belt. Then I looked at the hellhound, which had lost a lot of speed while crossing the water, and was showing dog-like behavior by opening its mouth while running. It approaches slowly with its mouth wide open, as if it is asking you to throw something into its mouth. That's how it seemed to Vakir, an experienced hunting dog. Tick. A bloody bean that Vakir flicked with his thumb went straight into the hellhound's mouth. And. The response came immediately. Wow. A hellhound wanted something and swallowed something that flew into its mouth. The guy started to stir up the game right away. Casting. Wow. Wow. Foam bubbles at the corners of the mouth and sticky vomit flows out. Watery feces were flowing out of the anus, and convulsions and seizures were occurring throughout the body. My heart was pumping as if it was going to burst, and my eyes were bloodshot and bursting out. As expected. Vikir nodded. A fact known to all hunters who have passed through the age of destruction. The fact is that canine monsters are weak to chocolate. The substances contained in chocolate beans are like poison to dogs. Even if it was a hound from hell, this was similar. Let's see. What were the symptoms? Mucousy vomiting, difficulty breathing, urinary incontinence, diarrhea, increased body temperature, increased heart rate, decreased appetite, convulsions, seizures, severe excitement and it was death, right? Vikir grabbed the blunt short sword. And he chased after the hellhound, which was escaping staggeringly into the depths of the tree's root tunnel. The stomach and heart would have been hit first. Next is liver. However, the hellhound's stomach, heart, and liver are protected by ribs stronger than steel. I couldn't penetrate that gap with the blunt short sword I currently own. 
In that case, it is best to aim for an area slightly off the ribs, but still weakened by the chocolate. The answer is kidneys. It can be quite damaging to the lower abdomen, which the hellhound's ribs cannot cover, and to the kidneys, which are overworked by the toxins from the chocolate. Bikir laid the short sword horizontally and stabbed hard. The blade was blunt and could not cut or pierce, but it was enough to pierce the skin, muscles, and kidneys beneath the flesh. Kong. Wow. The more shock there is on the kidneys, the weaker they become and the stronger the toxins become. The hellhound lay on the floor, licking the hot excrement that was still burning, and soon had its meter-long tongue pulled out. Vikir clearly cut off the last breath of the hellhound, who had become unable to resist. Hellhounds are not only canine monsters, but also oil world monsters that roam around with the hellfire of the oil world swallowed in their stomachs. If you don't kill it for sure, its vitality may become a threat again at any time, like a fire coming back from the ashes. I have to look again at the lights that have been extinguished. Bakir raised his short sword and completely extinguished the hellhound's last ember of life. Puck. 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 Wow. The only answer was to beat him like a dog like this with a blunt short sword. Yet. Something amazing happened. Tsutsutsutsu. When the hellhound died, an intangible energy came out of its corpse and inhabited Bakir's entire body. What many people call, experience points, effort points, karma, or, karma. When this mysterious and magical energy gained from killing monsters accumulates in the body, it immediately leads to the strengthening of the body. Bakir single-handedly defeated high-ranking monsters that children his age could not even imagine, and as a result, his body became even more powerful. In addition to the blessings of the river Styx, the experience gained from killing the hellhound was added. Bakir's body is now impervious to any poison, magic, or other physical force. Hmm. Have your bones gotten thicker? It looks like you've grown taller. The short sword in my hand became much lighter than before. Since the weight of the sword cannot suddenly decrease, it must be seen that the strength of the grip has strengthened. Bung, bung. While other eight to nine-year-olds find it difficult to wield with two hands, Bakiri handles the knife with one hand as if you were just using it. But there is still a long way to go to regain the strength you had when you were alive. If I keep this pace, I will be able to recover all my strength before the coming of age ceremony. Bakir is now only eight years old. The level is sword expert advanced. The other Baskervilles are at a level where they can only be seen after the coming of age ceremony. After the next seven years, I was confident enough to regain the strength of my previous life. Right now, if I come in first place in this practical exam, I will receive a reward. Vikir looked down at the hellhound's corpse with a satisfied expression. If you take this monster's still hot body back to the family, you will be guaranteed to win first place in the practical evaluation. Although there may be some problem with going outside the boundary area, it is a reprimand for the guardian knights who play the role of the guide dog, but rather a praise from the test taker's point of view. Oh my god, an eight-year-old child can go all the way to the unexplored zone outside the border area, where even spirit dogs can't handle it, and catch a level B plus dangerous monster, all by himself. Hugo's expression was already predictable. Chin. Bakir grabbed the hellhound by its tail and began to drag it. The corpse of a monster is subject to different laws from the gravity of the human world because its soul is mortgaged in the demon world. Because of this, the hellhound's body was much heavier than it looked, but it didn't matter because Vakir's strength was also different from that of a typical eight-year-old child. Crack duck duck duck. Vakir continued to move forward. It was an uphill road covered in thorns and vines, but it felt like a well-paved flower road. Now, all you have to do is go down and submit the hellhound's body to the guardian knights and take the title of first place in the practical evaluation. And when I thought about the reward I would receive, a smile came to my face. A huge reward that he could not have dared to dream of in his lifetime, a treasure whose true value no one even knows in this era, was waiting for Vakir. At that time. Here is one factor that stops Vakir in his tracks. No, several. Growling. Crying sounds coming from deep in the water behind. The tunnel created by twisted roots, the howling coming from deep in the throat, gets closer and closer. Oops. 
The Kier put down the Hellhound's body for a moment. I forgot. Hellhounds are monsters that live in packs. Yet. Yellow and red sulfur fires began to burn in various places in the darkness of the Flood Sea. Eleven hellhounds had already gathered around and surrounded Vikir. However. Vikir just grins, not the slightest bit discouraged. Rather, the hellhounds that faced that smile just crouched low and growled as if they were anxious. They say dogs recognize dogs. Even though he went through a world of destruction and passed through another cycle of reincarnation, he was unable to wash away the scent of blood deeply ingrained in his soul. Just like the bloody mamba, a poisonous snake that froze when it saw Vakir in the cradle, the hellhounds of the Red and Black Mountains also seem to not dare to behave carelessly in front of Vakir, who is showing his murderous spirit in earnest. Eventually, Vakir opened his mouth. Come quickly. There are still a lot of beans left. Bloody bean coffee beans rattle around my waist. Considering the body strengthened by catching one hellhound, the growth rate when all hellhounds gathered here are caught I can't even guess. When the Vikir and hellhound packs were in such a tense standoff. Wow. The vicious hellhounds suddenly curled their tails between their crotches and began to retreat. Vikir was a little surprised. Once a hellhound has bared its teeth, it will not turn its back even if it dies. But now, the hellhounds not only couldn't see their backs, but were running away in blatant fear. No matter how ferocious Vakir's viciousness is, since he still has the body of an eight-year-old child, it is not enough to drive out more than ten hellhounds. So what is it? What is the external factor that could cause these hellhounds to run away instead of chasing their tails? Eventually, Vakir soon learned what it was. Growling. The sound of boiling spit and sulfur fire. The owner of this area has appeared, forcing all the hellhounds to leave. Six eyeballs burning in the dark. Three heads sticking out of the tree's root cave. Did something like this live here? A top-level monster that even makes Vakir look surprised. Cerberus. Risk level, A+. Size, 7M. Location of Discovery, Red and Black Mountains, Part 7 Ridge. A.K.A., Hell's Dog. He is not interested in ghosts trying to enter hell, but he immediately tears them into pieces and turns them into rags if they try to escape from hell. It lives deep in the oil world, where all ghosts ultimately head, and is considered the ultimate of oil world monsters. A three-headed dog symbolizing hell itself appeared. Episode 11 Hounds of Hell, 4 An unpleasant crying sound that can be heard when bronze pieces rub against each other. Cerberus Risk level, A+. Size, 7M. Location of discovery, Red and Black Mountains, Part 7 Ridge. A.K.A., Hell's Dog. He is not interested in ghosts trying to enter Hell, but he immediately tears them into pieces and turns them into rags if they try to escape from Hell. It lives deep in the oil world, where all ghosts ultimately head, and is considered the ultimate of oil world monsters. This monster that spews gas, oil, and flames from deep within its three throats is Cerberus, the Hell Dog. Even Vakir, an experienced hunter, was an ultra-elite monster that I had only seen once from afar before returning. One day, the gate to the demon world suddenly opened, and monsters exploded from everywhere. On the day that signaled the beginning of a long disaster, more than three figures of warriors selected from the seven great families were killed by Cerberus, who was rampaging at the forefront. Because it was the early stages of the war when everyone was clumsy, the damage was even more severe. If Empress Morg Kamu, who was the youngest female head of the Morg family at the time, had not stepped forward, the damage would have grown uncontrollably. And now, that same Cerberus appeared before Vakir's eyes. Even in the face of this powerful monster, which would have been useless even if a hundred hellhounds attacked at once, Vakir remained calm. Right. Has Cerberus already crossed over? Why did this one that lived only around the seventh ridge come all the way here? As the saying goes, the area where Cerberus was originally discovered was the highlands of the Red and Black Mountains. But now Cerberus has come down to the low area of the first ridge. I don't know what brought this guy to this point. Crumbling. It was quite an awkward situation for Vakir. I can't help it. Vakir decided to turn over all the paddles he had hidden. There is no room to hide the skills before regression. 
Fortunately, I had already crossed the border so I didn't feel any gazes around me. There are no spirit dog guardian knights, so there is no need to fight while hiding your skills. Flash. Bakir took out the short sword and infused it with mana. The tip of the sword is overflowing with the aura of a gas that can only be created by those who have reached the advanced level of sword experts. Expert lesser equals wizard circle 1. Expert intermediate equals wizard circle 2. Expert advanced equals wizard circle 3. Graduator lesser equals wizard 4th circle. Graduator intermediate equals wizard 5 circles. Graduator advanced equals wizard circle 6. Sword master equals wizard 7th circle. This is the general formula for inaction. Burning from the tip of 8 year old Vakir's sword is a dense gaseous aura that looks as if it could turn into liquid at any moment. It symbolizes a high level expert, and if you are a wizard, it is equivalent to a level 3 skill. Before returning, I was in the same state as I was when I was about 20 years old. Vikir quickly moved his hands while raising his mana. The short sword moves, drawing strange scars in the air. A sharp tooth-shaped trail, it looked as if three teeth had been summoned in the air. Baskerville Type 3 A sword technique in which three teeth are drawn out with a sword and driven into the opponent's neck. In his previous life, Bakir had learned the Baskerville formula up to the fourth formula and was originally able to produce four teeth. In addition, he had the mana and aura of a graduator level, so if you compare then and now, his level is nothing short of shabby. But Vakir has another weapon. It has a small body, quick mobility, and a body strengthened by the protection of the river Styx. The pros and cons were clear. Vakir swung his sword and produced three teeth. The child's hands and arms were small and short, so he could not produce the fourth tooth, which was an organ in his previous life, but despite this, the gas aura and three teeth clearly extending from the tip of the sword were able to block Cerberus' claws well. Vikir felt something strange. Cerberus is too strong even before its return, but is it possible to deal with it even with the body of an infant, which is far inferior to its previous inaction? This means that there is something wrong with Cerberus as well. Indeed. Vikir's keen eye caught something. If you look closely at the inside of Cerberus' side, you can see a dent. It was clear that several ribs were broken, as his movements were slightly unnatural. There were even clearly visible arrowhead marks engraved near where the fur had been torn. Who caught it? Vikir laughed in bewilderment. Now that I think about it, there are barbarians living on the other side of the Red and Black Mountains. The barbaric tribes that the iron-blooded swordsman Baskerville and the famous sorcerer had been harassing Morg so much. If Cerberus was driven out here by the barbarians, his situation doesn't seem to be very good. Earth. Tong. Kong. Bakir gathered the aura that dispersed like gas and continued to block Cerberus' claws and teeth. Every time the sword and teeth clashed, the sound of metal clashing with bronze was heard, and sparks were flying. Crumbling. Wow. Jeez. Cerberus tried to bite Bakir by moving its three heads, but failed every time. I'm kind of used to fighting with triplets. It's not that it's not. It is true that the swordsmanship and trident tactics of the triplets high bro, middle bro, and low bro were inspired by the combat methods of Cerberus. I'm used to it because I was bullied horribly by the triplets during numerous practical evaluations in my past life. Most of the numerous anomalous patterns were also well known. The triplets in their previous lives were skilled and smart, so they learned Cerberus attack patterns as if they were born with them, and Vikir is reminiscing about those times and dealing with Cerberus. Boom! Baskerville Type 1, sharp teeth bounce off Cerberus teeth. Kong! Baskerville Type 2, the second tooth gets halfway into Cerberus neck. Phew! In Baskerville Type 3, the third tooth strikes the second tooth, causing it to become lodged even deeper in Cerberus' neck. Bakir's Baskerville ceremony was clearly similar to the ordinary Baskerville ceremony, but it was subtly different. There is something about the swordsman who came through the Age of Destruction that the swordsman of the previous era cannot imitate. The existing swordsmanship theories of the peaceful era were completely reinterpreted through the Era of Destruction, during which unnecessary flab, fat, and grease were lost to the limit. A sword that moves only to kill the opponent. 
extreme practical experience was added to this. To give an analogy, the swordsmanship of the common people is like well-marbled beef, the swordsmanship of the Baskerville family is like dry chicken breast, and the current swordsmanship of the Kier is like dry beef jerky. The ultimate essence is the killing intent directed at the other person. The Kier's sword has a clear sense of purpose. Pow! The short sword struck Cerberus' side. The aura that was flowing like a gas exploded, and Cerberus let out a scream. However, Cerberus is a hellish dog, so he is not discouraged by this. The guy jabbed his claws into the empty space right below the short sword's path. Sigh. Since I have taken the other person's bones, it is natural that I must offer up my own flesh. Bikir's back suddenly buckled. But. Surprisingly, the body, which had been pickled in the river Styx, withstood Cerberus' claws. But twice would be too much. Vikir frowned. Although the internal organs were not ruptured, several ribs were clearly broken. And to make matters worse. Hakong. The short sword, which could not withstand Vikir's aura, eventually broke. This. Difficult voyage. But a skilled hunter always finds the best route even in these situations. That. It's the 36th step. 36 strategies devised by the head of the Leviathan family, the most knowledgeable of the seven great families in the art of war. Among them, the 36th one is Juasangchik. Hodadak. Bikir quickly turned around and kicked the ground as hard as he could. Then Cerberus, who gained victory, chases after Bikir. Crumble. Cerberus attacked in an instant, and if it weren't for the large scar on its side, it would have been caught a long time ago. Bikir escaped the flood, expressing deep gratitude to the nameless barbarian tribe beyond the mountains. Yet. The border that Bikir crossed is visible. Fortunately, or unfortunately, there were no guide dogs around. Bikir jumped over the barbed wire marking the border and ran. Cerberus rammed into the barbed wire and stakes in front of him, destroying them, and thrust three of his heads into Vikir's back. Kung. Wow. Fuck. Is there anything more powerful than a hunting dog chasing down its prey? Cerberus opens his mouth in triumph. The distance has now narrowed to just around the corner. Soon. Soon you will be able to chew the flesh of your prey and crush its bones. Slurp. If it hadn't been for the floor suddenly sinking below. Deeply. Suddenly the floor collapsed. Cerberus threw himself into a pit that had been covered with dry straw to make it indistinguishable from the flat ground. Cerberus, who fell into the trap, lost his body's balance, but immediately stepped on the floor and tried to jump back up the pit. But that was impossible. Puff poop. This is because numerous wooden spears stuck upside down on the floor pierced the body. Sweet. A tearing scream erupted from each of Cerberus's three heads. There were countless wooden spears sticking out of the bottom of the hole dug by Vakir. Of course, most of the wooden spears broke without being able to pierce Cerberus' hard skin, but some of them still penetrated Cerberus' body and left fatal wounds. It was in the lower abdomen, inside the side, near the area where there was a deep arrowhead-shaped wound. Welcome to the Cradle of Stabs. Vikir congratulated himself briefly. Originally, this trap was made in preparation for being chased by other monsters such as hellhounds. These are things that were installed just to hinder movement or a little bit. Although I am now reaping quite unexpected income. Softly, softly. Cerberus' entire body trembled violently, snapping and breaking the wooden spears lodged in its side and mouth. The anger that burned like crazy, but what made Cerberus' body tremble before that was something a little different. Blood Bean Vikir boiled the blood bean coffee beans and soaked the wooden spear in the boiled water, allowing the energy to soak into the tip of the spear. Cerberus is also a canine monster. A large amount of chocolate energy seeps straight into the body through the blood from the wound. However, like a high-ranking monster, it did not fall down right away. Foam bubbling around the mouth, burning excrement dripping from the anus, and the thick smell of chocolate coffee. But even so, the three heads stand erect and stare at Vikir. Vikir opened the bag and took out all the bloody beans. Tick. Tick, tick. Sudden. Beans fly toward Cerberus's three wide-open mouths. 
Most of the beans that Bakir threw went into Cerberus's mouth, which had been slowed down by the spear. Accordingly, Cerberus' movements become increasingly slower. Tuduk. Pop. Eventually, Cerberus completely broke several wooden spears embedded in his body and then pushed Vakir to the corner of the pit. It's about time the blood bean bag was empty. Cerberus is devastated, but he still has enough strength left to make a final leap and kill his prey by biting the back of the neck. Knowing this, Vakir, who had been driven to a dead end, seemed extremely cautious. Soon, Cerberus moved. Vikir also rushes forward, clutching a wooden spear. Pot. The wooden spear thrown by the hunter flew through the air and grazed Cerberus' body. The wooden spear seemed to be slightly inserted into the wound on the side, but was quickly pulled out helplessly. If it weren't for the original arrow mark, it would have bounced off. Cerberus bared his teeth at the defenseless Vikir. Cerberus' six eyes were burning even more intensely at the thought that he would soon see the end of the prey he had so troubled. But. Beetle. Cerberus, who was running, stumbles for a moment. Cerberus suddenly loses his balance, and although he is embarrassed, he calmly takes a step forward again. Stumble. However, even with the second step, something was out of focus. The third step was the same, on the fourth step my legs bent in a strange direction and I almost fell, and on the fifth step I fell over. And on the sixth step, he was barely able to drag his body forward, and on the seventh step, he fell to the floor without even being able to crawl. Just seven times. This is the number of steps Cerberus took while approaching Bakir. That was his last. Kiel Pudiak. The three heads, with foam bubbling at the corners of their mouths, were stuck on the red dirt floor and could never move again. Only then was Vakir able to sit down, leaning against the cliff. There is something worth hiding. The hunter's gaze is directed at the wooden spear that was thrown earlier. A wooden spear that only grazed Cerberus. But that wooden spear is a little different from other wooden spears. Attached to the tip of the spear are two small but sharp thorns. At the tip of this dried up thorn, you can see a black energy. The fangs of a snake make it difficult to walk seven steps if bitten even once. The bloody mamba's malicious intent was still shining. Episode 12, Binge Eating Paris, 1. A limp Cerberus. Greasy saliva and feces flow from three mouths and one anus. At the same time. Tsutsutsutsu. Immediately after Cerberus died, the soul extracted from its body inhabited Bakir's entire body. This mysterious energy, called karma, experience points, etc., makes the body and mind of those who defeat monsters more noble. It might be hard to carry this. Vikir tried to move Cerberus' body, but soon gave up. And it was decided to just leave Cerberus' body here. In any case, the cause of Cerberus' death was clear, and there were many guide dogs who saw Vikir sharpening a wooden spear in this hideout, so there were many people who could prove it. So, all you have to do is remove a few important parts and internal organs and bury them in a secret place. More than anything. This isn't important right now. Bakir was looking beyond Cerberus' corpse into the deep water where it had come. Cerberus is basically a gatekeeper-type monster with an innate tendency to protect its territory. Regardless of whether he was pushed here by barbarians or not, it was clear that there was probably a dungeon guarded by Cerberus nearby. A dungeon is a cave-shaped place containing treasures that is often the target of adventurers, and most of them are also the habitats of powerful, high-ranking monsters. Now that Cerberus is dead, it's most likely empty. In general, monsters are attracted to strong magical energy, so there was a high possibility that there were artifacts with strong magical energy in the dungeon where Cerberus was located. To put it bluntly, Cerberus is not a monster that can easily be found in any tunnel. Bakir searched outside the border area with the keen sense of spirit that Baskerville hounds usually have. Just by lightly smearing Cerberus feces on one's body, quite a few monsters, including hellhounds, ran away. The hunter's eyes trace Cerberus's footprints and drool marks buried in the dry dirt, rotten leaves, damp roots, and gloomy darkness. As I crawled under dead thorn trees, burnt roots, and rotten old trees, the depth of the flood damage soon became apparent. Dungeon. It was a crypt located low between large mounds of earth. It is placed in an exquisite position so as not to be conspicuous from above. 
It was not created by Cerberus, and it is presumed that it has been there for quite some time. Of course, this place was also a place in Vakir's memories. It will probably be discovered in about ten years. But I think it was an empty dungeon back then. But now it is different. The smell of the devil hidden behind the rotten smell. An inexperienced hunting dog might have overlooked it, but Vakir took it in stride. Clattering. Vakir broke the pile of dried earth and swept down the slope along with the silt. Soon, a dungeon made of reddish dirt and rocks appears. A vein of ruby ore was clearly visible outside the mound, probably connected to Red All Mountain, a tributary of the Red and Black Mountains. As I entered the darkness of the cave, a deep and winding passage came into view. A place so dark and deep that you have to trace it with your hands. But surprisingly, the inside of the dungeon was spacious and bright. There was a fairly spacious stone chamber, and around it was a fist-sized ruby gemstone sticking out, emitting a dusky red light. A stone chamber stained blood-red by ruby light. Vikir looked at his long shadow casting on the wall of the stone chamber. Is it a dungeon with nothing in it? The inside of the stone room was just empty. No, it wasn't completely empty. At the end of the area where Vikir's long shadow reached, there was a skeleton scattered. A skeleton with bones all over its body cut and broken as if it had been stabbed with a knife. Looking closely, the ruby-colored stone chamber is completely covered in blood. Looking at the dried brown blood stains, it seemed like a very long time had passed. Yet. Vikir found a page of handwriting written next to the skull. First of all, my name is Fine. I will roughly refer to him as, Gain. Is there any need to tarnish this pure white paper with my name? After thinking about it several times, I am writing down a few words to prevent future generations from making the same mistake I did. It was an unusual journal from the beginning. Vikir continued to read the text, relying on the red blood. After some time, Vikir realized that the letters were written in the Baskerville script. Are they the ancestors of Baskerville? It was a reasonable inference. This stone chamber is an ancient dungeon that was talked about as a legend within the family. My younger brother and I stumbled upon this place, went through countless trials to explore it, and eventually reached this last room. It turns out that this dungeon once had a fairly tough difficulty level. Now, all that remains is an empty, lonely crypt. And it is presumed that the person who wrote this note and the skeletons lying around here were twin brothers. My brother and I arrived here after killing countless monsters. However, the final task received in this stone chamber bound our brother's feet tightly. For a whopping three years. Vikir raised his head. What is the task I am talking about? The question was soon resolved. This is because there were words engraved on the stone wall in the direction the skull of the skeleton was facing. One to come in, two to come in, one to go out. It was a strange riddle. Vikir looked at the note again. My brother and I thought about this dark phrase for a long time. However, considering that this dungeon was passed down as a legend among our Baskerville family, the meaning is clear. Me and my brother. Doesn't this mean that only one of the two can achieve what they want in this dungeon? Twin brothers who entered the dungeon. They were originally one when they were conceived in their mother's womb, but split into two when they came into the world. And in order to get what they want and get out of this dungeon, they must become one again. In reality, it was impossible for twin bodies to become one, so they had to kill each other to remain as one. It is already the custom of the Baskervilles to naturally encourage competition between brothers. The two brothers began a long fight with each other, and the fight ended with the younger brother's death. So the younger brother here becomes Abel. Cain and Abel. The older brother who had to kill his younger brother in order to be chosen. Eventually, Bakir turned his head and looked at the skull. Hanging over the end of the skull is one's own shadow. Shadow. Right. Vikir raised his fist. Then, he smashed the large ruby ore that illuminated the stone chamber red with his fist. Clink. When the ruby breaks, the magical power faintly contained within it disappears. The interior of the stone chamber was suddenly immersed in darkness. Okay. Kugagagagagaga quabang. A strange thing happened. The stone wall on one side of the stone chamber had collapsed. 
The wall was so thick that its thickness alone could reach tens of meters. It is so large that you would never think it was a door. Vikir nodded. The answer to the riddle was simple. Shadow. When you enter, you are completely one in the dark passage, but the moment you enter the stone room illuminated by ruby light, the shadows separate. And when the ruby is removed and complete darkness comes, the shadow returns to the body. Only when they become one will the final stage of the stone chamber be opened. Vikir moved forward cautiously. Fortunately, the space beyond the stone wall was a single, flat road and there were no major traps. Cain and Abel would have cleared out the swarming monsters a long time ago, so all that remains is to check the dungeon's rewards. Soon, something cold touched Vikir's fingertips. It is the handle of a sword. The sword was firmly stuck vertically in the rock, and there was an inscription engraved on the front of it. Vikir fumbled with his fingertips and read the words. Only the blood of the Baskervilles is this, you will be able to pull it out. The text mentioned the last name Baskerville and Carl's name. And the moment he learned Carl's name, a shock like a thunderbolt struck Vikir. Was this an artifact found here? Episode 13, Binge Eating Paris, 2 only the blood of the Baskervilles can select this, Beelzebub. Dot. The text mentioned the last name Baskerville and Carl's name. Was this an artifact discovered here? Bakir traced the outline of the sword with the extremely fine rays of light emitted from the broken ruby shards. A black awl that looks like an elongated snout sticking out of a three bead shaped knife base that is round and reddish like a ruby. The area around the rough handle is shiny green and looks like a large fly. Vikir knew the identity of this relic. When I was a child in my previous life, I clearly remember seeing it in an illustration on a page of a mythology book. Beelzebub, the gluttonous fly. If I were to explain the origin of this knife, it would be long. To summarize briefly. In a long ago myth, there were unprecedented great demonic beasts that invaded this continent, also known as the Seven Great Plagues, and all humans on the entire continent joined forces to defeat these demonic constellations. And the remains of these seven demon constellations remained in this world in some form, whether material or idea, and although they were no longer in a position to interfere with the causal law, they retained some of the power they had when they were alive. One of them was this sword Beelzebub. It is known that the heads of seven families, including the first head of the Baskerville family, took down one evil constellation each, and the head of the Baskerville family at that time was in charge of Beelzebub, the throne of gluttony. For this reason, the remains of Beelzebub were stored in the Baskerville family's territory, and the strong magical energy emitted by this relic attracted powerful monsters nearby, an old legend that few people believe in today. But the legend was true, and later this sword fell into the hands of demons. This forgotten relic suddenly appeared on the battlefield one day and drove countless people to death. Even among the demons, the owner of this sword continued to change, and the number of demons may have been much greater than the number of humans killed by this sword. But now the situation is a little different. Beelzebub's remains came into the hands of Vikir. In my previous life, I was robbed by demons and I didn't even know that I was robbed, but that won't be the case anymore. Buzz buzz buzz. The sword began to resonate with the mana emitted by Vikir. The sound of the wings of flies fluttering loudly in my ears. When Vikir stretched out his hand and touched it, the all Beelzebub surprisingly began to be absorbed into the palm of his hand as if it were a part of Vikir's body. Pot. As Vikir stretches out his hand and exerts strength, a black all emerges from the artery in his wrist. Beelzebub will quietly hide in Vikir's body like this, and when the master's command is given, he will come out and become an extra canine. However, Beelzebub is a strange sword made from the corpse of a demonic constellation. This is not the end of this ability. Growling. The moment Beelzebub entered his body, an enormous hunger suddenly began to squeeze Vikir's stomach. What is this? Vikir was a little embarrassed. In my previous life, I was used to starving for a week and eating everything in one meal. There were many times when I went into the field and stayed in hiding for a month, drinking only water. A stomach that has been trained so harshly rarely gets upset. Even if I returned to the body of a child, there was no way I would be this immature. Growling. Once more, my stomach twists as if struggling. 
Bakir realized that this extreme hunger was not a common phenomenon. Are you asking for something? That's right. Beelzebub buzzed with the sound of the wings of a fly flapping and encouraged Vakir. Sniff sniff. I guess my sense of smell has also become more sensitive, and I smell something delicious somewhere. It's the smell of a devil. A delicious smell wafting from outside the dungeon. Bakir crawled out of the dungeon and dug into the tree's root tunnel. As you approach the border area and return to your original location, the smell becomes stronger. The first thing I encountered was the corpse of a hellhound. Even though Beelzebub was not called, he was the first to stick out his teeth. Normally, a hunting dog that shows its teeth without the owner's command to do so should be subject to corporal punishment. But Vikir made an exception this time. Because the hunger I shared with him was so intense. I guess I've been starving for a long time. The rock where Beelzebub was stuck and the soil near it were very dry and twisted. No, isn't it perhaps because of Beelzebub's crazy hunger that the entire red and black mountains are made up of withered old trees and parched earth? So how much food do we need to feed this guy in the future to soothe his bulimia? Bakir shook his head and shook off his random thoughts. The power that Beelzebub had was enough to bear that price. Yet. The Beelzebub that Bakir knew began to clearly show its power. Gulp, 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 gulp. Beelzebub, stuck in the hellhound's corpse near the neck, began to suck blood at an incredible speed. Blood and internal juices enter Vakir through Beelzebub's all pipe. The hungry intestines are filled. I could feel my twisted internal organs coming back into place. Sparkle. Vakir observed that one of Beelzebub's three eyes glowed unusually red. I gained a skill. Yes. Vikir's intuition is correct. Beelzebub, the gluttonous fly, had the power to steal the unique characteristics or special skills of others during his lifetime. The scope of that absorption was almost infinite, and many people lost to Beelzebub all the achievements they had made throughout their lives and turned into incompetence and ruined people. Unfortunately, since this is a hazard, it does not have that much of an impact. The number of skills that can be taken from the opponent is limited to three. Beelzebub of Vikir gained one skill by sucking the blood of a hellhound. Beelzebub, the binge-eating fly slash all. Minus one slot, bleeding, hellhound, B+. Plus. Minus two slots, none. Minus three slots, none. An ability that can only be revealed by Vikir's will. Anyone pierced by this all will feel the full mortal power of the teeth of the hound of hell. In general, even shallow and minor wounds that do not bleed will inevitably draw blood over time, and the bleeding will last much longer than an ordinary wound. Meanwhile, extremely, steadily, Beelzebub sucked the hellhound's body until it was almost a mummy before falling. I took away the skill right away, but it seems I was just hungry. Vikir also felt his hunger subsiding to some extent. Growling. But even so, I'm still hungry. The delicious smell that passed my nose was still coming from far away. Vikir hurriedly escaped the flood. Soon, a familiar border line appears. Cradle. You can see the space where the young children of the Baskervilles take their exams. As I quietly crossed the border, I saw the hole I had dug under a rock in the distance. Fortunately, it seems that the guide dogs have not come under surveillance yet. Well, no matter how much it is called a cradle, the area is quite large. The guide dog surveillance would not have reached every part of the testing site. Moreover, since they spent a lot of time just sitting in the pit, it is clear that Bakir was already classified as a safe surveillance target and surveillance was neglected. Bakir crossed the border and went down to the hideout and removed all the dirt and fallen leaves that had been lightly covered. Eventually, an appetizing piece of meat appears. Cerberus. It was lying around just as it was when it died. Buzz buzz buzz. Beelzebub, who smells fatty meat, is so happy that he dies. The sound of the flies flapping became louder. Soon, Beelzebub sank his fangs into Cerberus' corpse and began gorging on meat and intestines. However, Bakir stopped Beelzebub. Whoa whoa this is proof of the practical evaluation. If you damage it too much, it will be difficult to explain it during an autopsy later. Still, Beelzebub pays no heed and rushes in from the snout. 
Vikir's expression became grim. No. Match. Vikir struck the back of his hand violently. He hit the back of his own hand, so of course it hurt. And when Vikir is sick, Beelzebub is also sick. Twisting. Only then did Beelzebub notice and removed the fangs from Cerberus' body. Vikir noticed new blood and abilities flowing through the arteries on the back of his hand. Beelzebub, the binge-eating fly slash all. Minus one slot, burn, Cerberus, A+. Plus. Minus two slot, bleeding, Hellhound, B+. Plus. Slot three, high-speed playback, gutter rat Norvegicus, F. Is it because Cerberus is an even more powerful monster? Blood of Cerberus occupied one slot. Hellhound pushed to slot two. And, strangely enough, slot three was filled with the blood of a gutter rat. Perhaps the bone fragments and skins of discarded rats were strewn beneath Cerberus' body. It seems that if you catch a stronger monster, you can delete the previous skill. Vikir chuckled as he saw that, among the three arteries pulsing around his wrist, the one through which the rat's blood flowed was particularly shriveled. For now, Vikir decided to leave it alone, thinking it would be better to have something in it than to leave it as an empty slot. Above all, obtaining the Vibern skill of Hell Dog Cerberus was a great harvest. Now, anyone who is pierced by this black all will suffer burns that will never heal naturally due to the flames of the oil world possessed by Cerberus, the dog of hell. Once you get stabbed even once, you have to endure the burning pain until you die. Considering that one of the worst pains a human can feel is burning pain, it must have been much worse than the bleeding skill that the hellhound had. Ruler. Now I have everything I can get from this mountain. There isn't much to do now. Stay like this until the end of the practical evaluation, then submit Cerberus' body to the guide dogs and receive a first place evaluation. And perhaps Vikir will be rewarded for this. Vikir closed his eyes and checked his body condition. As a wizard, he has already accumulated about four circles of mana. The number of Baskerville teeth that can be drawn with a knife is three. No, now maybe four. This is the stage where you are looking at the beginning of the graduator at the highest level of sword expert. If evaluated lightly, it would be at the top level of expert, but if evaluated generously, it would be at the beginner level of graduate. In actual practice, I perform at half the level of my ability, so it is correct to consider myself an expert. In my last life, no matter how much mana I accumulated and how skilled my combat experience became, I was unable to draw more than four teeth due to the limitations of my sword skills. For reference, the current Hugo knew a swordsmanship technique that could wield seven teeth, and the Hugo before returning knew a sword technique that could wield nine teeth. Baskerville Type 9 This is a swordsmanship that extends only to the head of the family and his immediate descendants, the eldest eldest son who will inherit the family, and the illegitimate son who will assist him. It was a powerful and sophisticated swordsmanship that was on a completely different level from the four styles that Bakir had learned. But now it's different. Type 10. Baskerville Type 10. 10 Teeth. The ultimate state that no Baskerville in this world can reach. A legendary swordsmanship textbook that contains the teachings of the first head of the family, who is said to have subjugated the evil constellations belonging to the seven great plagues in the distant past. Vikir knew the location of the treasure. There's no need to go far. Surprisingly, it is rotting in a very nearby place, among miscellaneous books that are so common and close that anyone can easily read them. Who gives it to you? Hugo Les Baskerville, head of the Baskerville family. He will personally hand it over to Vakir. I couldn't even imagine how much the miscellaneous books I was handing over were worth. Episode 14, Eating Alone, 1. The practical evaluation is over. The hunting dogs continue to ply their trade. Usually, hunting dogs receive the flesh or internal organs of the game they catch as a reward and distribute it according to rank. The same was true for the children of the Baskervilles. The guys acquired shields, swords, and necklaces made from parts of the corpses of monsters they caught during the practical evaluation as trophies. Through this opportunity, the young hunting dogs grew more dignified and became stronger both physically and mentally. The nerves that had been tense until the written test was over seemed to have disappeared after the rankings were determined, and the children were seen to have become even closer than before. 
Perhaps due to the experience of being together in extreme situations for a long time, a strange brotherly feeling was developing throughout the class. Of course, despite this, there were still some brothers who had a bad relationship, but most of them resolved their feuds during the practical exam or died unnoticed, so surprisingly, there were almost no infighting within the class. Like this, there is a relaxed atmosphere in Baskerville Street for a few days a year after the practical exam is over. Please go. Hugo Baskerville, the head of the Baskerville family, was receiving a report from Deacon Barrymore. Who caught what? It is almost impossible for a superhuman who has risen to the rank of swordmaster to doubt his own body. But at this moment, Hugo was clearly doubting his ears. Deacon Barrymore read the report again clearly, his voice unable to contain his excitement. Bikir Van Baskerville from the eight-year-old class. During the practical evaluation, I accidentally crossed the boundary line and entered the prohibited area. Succeeded in hunting Cerberus, a dangerous A-plus rank monster. That is all. This is my second report, but it is always thrilling. An eight-year-old child went to the unexplored area of the Red and Black Mountains and returned alive. Actually, this alone is great enough. Just being able to listen to testimonies or draw maps that provide insight into the terrain and ecosystem outside the USC ban zone is a tremendous achievement. However, this unprecedented eight-year-old child not only went into hell and came back safe, but he also captured Cerberus, Hell's dog. Cerberus is a high-ranking monster that even the family's guardian knights find it burdensome to deal with. Hugo smoothed his beard with an expression of bewilderment. However, the detailed report that followed was even more absurd. Hugo adjusted his report and put on his reading glasses. You lured Cerberus into a trap and then stabbed him with a wooden spear. Do you think this makes sense? It was originally an object that had been injured by barbarians, and there is also information that poison was applied to the wooden spear, matriarch. No matter how injured the individual was, that's true. What poison is strong enough to send Cerberus away? Where did he get that? That is there was nothing else recorded in the hunting log. I was going to ask the master, but he said he was tired and went straight back to his dorm. Hugo looked blank for a moment at Butler Barrymore's words, but then burst into laughter. The young guy is already suspicious. But. Information is power, and power is value. You have to raise and protect your own self-worth. Hugo turned his attention back to the report. I'm proud that they didn't immediately reveal what poison was used to kill Cerberus, but I'm also proud that they didn't drag Cerberus' body straight to the guide dogs, but instead covered it with dirt and hid it until the practical evaluation was over. Deacon Barrymore was amazed. Your patience is truly amazing. When I was an eight-year-old child, I would do anything to be praised by adults and respected by my siblings. If I had caught Cerberus when I was eight years old, I would have presented it to the Guardian Knights right away. To receive praise and attention. He he he. If I did that, I would end up looking like old Santiago. The old man mentioned by Hugo is a fisherman who appears in a legend from long ago. He went out to sea and caught a huge monster fish, but while he was dragging the fish he caught by tying it to the boat, he encountered a school of sharks and all the flesh was taken away, and he returned home with only a huge bone. If Fakir brags about having caught Cerberus and drags that huge corpse around, he would have become a target for many brothers. Not only would I lose all my achievements, I could have been murdered. After hearing Hugo's words, Deacon Barrymore feels a chill go down his spine again at the bloody family tradition of the Baskervilles. Honestly, I was very surprised. It's not like the middle name is Re or La, but among the students with the middle name of the class, such a talented person emerges. You don't know what the butler is. I am different from previous matriarchs. When raising a hunting dog, bloodline is not considered important. Even among dogs with good bloodlines, there are ugly ones, and among dogs with poor bloodlines, there are excellent ones. I don't care whether the son is born to an imperial woman or a street prostitute. As long as you have enough talent and willpower. Hugo mumbles in a low voice, his eyes looking outside the window towards a distant steeple. Second son. Deacon Barrymore noticed that Hugo was thinking about his second son, who was currently training at the top of the spire. It is said that even among dogs with good bloodlines, there are some ugly ones. You understand, right? 
I'm sorry. Hugo waved his hand. Are you okay? It only hurts me if I get upset because of my idiot son. I just need something to change my mind. His gaze moved away from the window and this time towards the report. Butler Barrymore realized his master's intention and bowed his head. I will call Master Vakir. It was a few hours later that Vakir stood in front of Hugo. Hugo still did not handle fish heads and tails. I just brought up the issue about the torso. How did you catch Cerberus? I caught him by putting chocolate on his throat. The same was true for Vakir. Direct entry. It's great. Immediate question and answer. There was no fat or fat in the conversation between Hugo and Vakir. In Hugo's eyes, Li Chai was young. Chocolate. Chocolate is poison to canine monsters. Ha. Huh. Is that why you asked for chocolate last time? Yes. Vakir answered briefly. After thinking for a moment, Hugo opened his mouth again. If it is true, the value of the information is quite great. It will be useful when subduing canine monsters. There will be many advantages when increasing dispatch results and when trading with information guilds. I think so too. The corner of Hugo's mouth slightly turned up at Bakir's calm answer. Hugo asked in a somewhat cold voice. I heard that when the butler asked, you didn't give a proper answer about hunting Cerberus. You're right. Because he is not my master. The owner? Yes. Then who is your master? Vikir once again answers Hugo's question calmly. I belong to a family, so wouldn't the master of the family be my master? At those words, Hugo finally nodded and smiled in satisfaction. You learned it well. As a reward, the corpse of the monster you caught will completely belong to you. Cerberus, a monster of danger level A plus rank. Its corpse was literally worth the price. Teeth and claws are used as weapons, intestines and meat are used as health food, and bones and skin are used as armor. There is nothing left to throw away when it comes to the corpse of a high-ranking monster. It was a very great reward to receive all of this in its entirety. Moreover, Hugo gave Vakir another award. Since you took first place in both the written and practical tests, the family's expectations for you are high. If there's anything you want, just tell me. Didn't you already hand over Cerberus' body? That is my opinion. I want to hear your thoughts. Vikir opened his eyes a little wider. Hugo's words were somewhat surprising. This is because he has never had a history of asking his children what they think. All you have to do is give commands to the hunting dogs. Who would ask a dog what he thinks? But these variables are always welcome. Thinking it would make things easier, Bakir voiced his opinion. I want to go into the Mansang library. Hugo's eyes narrow at those words. The library of all things is a huge library located deep within the Baskerville family's fortress, and is large enough to rival the House of Morgue's library, which is said to be the largest in the world. Hugo rested his chin and thought for a moment. This is rare for him. Hmm. Go to all things. It is a place where only members of the blood family, including the head of the family and the head of the small family, can enter. Did you know this and asked? At those words, Bakir opened his eyes wide. It seemed like I had no idea. But she actually didn't know. I didn't know because I never had to go into the library in my previous life. It was sufficient to receive culture, swordsmanship, and other knowledge from classes within the family. I lived a life satisfied with reality and had no desire to learn more. That was the virtue of the dog and it was tamed that way. I didn't know. If it's not possible, I will give up. Vikir quickly stepped back. Well, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is sneak in at night. But things turned out easier than expected. You may come in. Hugo's judgment was quick. Before Vikir could even make a blank expression, Hugo continued. I can't give you much time. Would ten days be enough? It only takes one day. There is no need to instill caution in Hugo by spending a long time in the library. Hugo looked down at Vikir with a faint smile. What book are you planning to read in just one day? 
During my liberal arts class, I learned about family history and I just wanted to know more. As one Baskerville. Although he only mentioned random books, Hugo seemed to quite like Vakir's answer. It's the family history. Feel so good. It's good to feel proud by studying your family's honorable history. When you see them talking about things like pride that weren't even mentioned. Hugo even personally recommended books for Vakir to read. In the deep part of the Mansang Library, in the middle row of the library in the sixth control area, there is a swordsmanship textbook called Baskerville's Sixth Type. Please read it. Vikir couldn't believe his ears when he heard that. Hugo of the World recommends a swordsmanship textbook. Mr. Ban's last name goes beyond the limit of four meals, to a whopping six meals. Baskerville Meat Eater. This sword technique, which allows drawing six teeth, can only be practiced by the elite within the family and even among the direct lineage. Hugo has now granted it to Vakir. Even if it is just a brief viewing. Considering that the current Hugo was expected to produce seven teeth and the pre-reversion Hugo was expected to produce nine teeth, this treatment of Hugo was truly unprecedented. Compared to the four styles that Vakir had learned before returning, the meat style was a powerful sword technique on a completely different level. But. Vikir, who is aiming for something else, may not be very impressed. Just like eating meat. A thought so outrageous that others would faint if they heard it. But Vikir is not stupid enough to reveal it. Thank you. I will definitely read it and it will live up to your expectations. Vikir bowed his head and expressed his gratitude to Hugo. On the outside, it was a flawless, very humble and polite greeting. Of course, if Hugo had known what kind of evil was lurking inside, he would have probably stopped it even if it meant burning all the secrets in the Mansang library. Hugo, who thought he had finished all his business, simply turned his head indifferently. Vikir, who had obtained access to the Mansang library, bowed politely until the end and then turned around and left the house. And I started heading straight towards the natural treasure that might be the most valuable in all of the Baskervilles. Episode 15, Eating Alone, 2. Mansang Library. It is a large library located deep within the Baskerville family's main castle, and its size rivals that of the rest of the empire. Now that I think about it, this is my first time coming in and seeing it in person. Vikir passed through the entrance guarded by several knights and entered the restricted area. When Hugo presented the pass that he personally signed, no one blocked the way. Some knights even gave a salute with a faint smile. Eventually, Bakir stood in front of the passage leading to the depths of the Mansang Library. This library, created by digging a tunnel directly into the black rock wall, is deep and distant, like the throat of a giant monster. The books piled up here and there looked like big teeth, looking down at Bakir. I guess I'll have to hurry up a bit. Since I was alone all the time, my monologues increased. Bakir walked around the library thinking about the time remaining. Although my heart was racing, my steps and gaze moved slowly. The unique feel of an old book, the smell of ink and dust. But I didn't think it was particularly cozy or anything. Books that discuss techniques for handling cold weapons, calculation methods for killing enemies in the shortest route, and theories of efficient and logical murder. And a library filled with them. Countless swordsmen from previous eras in the history of the Baskerville family are here, engaged in a quiet war of words, remaining only as theories. Is that why? Rather than entering a library, I felt like I was walking down the hallway of a prison where cold and cold murderous maniacs were imprisoned. I can feel the piercing gaze from the swordsmanship textbooks lined up like teeth. And Vikir accepted all of this with ease. Giapuk, Giapuk, Giapuk. The sound of footsteps sinking into the abyss of the hallway. The deeper you go into the library, the older books you see. Cutting front teeth, swordsmanship, cutting molars, swordsmanship, piercing fangs, swordsmanship, double stuck double teeth, swordsmanship, lying wisdom teeth, swordsmanship. Familiar swordsmanship textbooks, swordsmanship textbooks that I had wanted to learn so much in my past life, and swordsmanship textbooks that were so powerful that I had never even dared to dream of them were lined up neatly like teeth. The locks were firmly locked to prevent theft or thieves. Usually, collateral and illegitimate children, no matter how much mana they have and a wealth of practical combat experience, are difficult to learn swordsmanship of type 4 or higher. 
Direct lineages learn at least type 5 swordsmanship, elites among direct lineages learn level 6 swordsmanship, and Gaju and Sagaju learn swordsmanship of type 7. Hugo Baskerville has now mastered the seven Baskervilles, and the seven teeth he draws have made him one of the few sword masters and sword masters on the continent. Since he has a rivalry with the head of the House of Morg, known as the Grand Wizard of the Seventh Circle, his inaction must be somewhat similar. Yet. Vikir paused for a moment. In a vast library, a sea of books where you can't tell which book is stored where. In one of them, you can see the book that Hugo had secretly told you about. A bookshelf with multiple locks as if it were a valuable book. When I matched the key Hugo gave me, the book hidden inside was revealed. Baskerville Meat Eating, Six Forms, Double Teeth. Meat Eating. A book containing swordsmanship so noble that I could never have even dreamed of it in my previous life. Vikir picked it up and looked through it. Methods for cutting, stabbing, blocking, crushing, cutting, and mincing are described in detail according to the shape of the teeth drawn by the knife's trajectory. And this swordsmanship textbook discussed how to draw a total of six teeth. Naturally, Hugo must have thought it was impossible for eight-year-old Vikir to memorize them in one day. So, out of a certain amount of favor and a certain degree of belittling, he would have allowed Vikir to read the book on the law of meat-eating. However, Vikir is an expert swordsman who has lived on the battlefield for forty years of his previous life, an elite who survived even after going through the era of destruction, and a Baskerville among Baskervilles. Of course, I have already mastered the swordsmanship theories of formulas one to four. To the extent that he already guessed and established the theory of equation five on his own, even though he had not even learned it formally. It was a time when I accumulated and accumulated extreme proficiency at the level of the four types, but was stagnant because I did not know the way to rise above it. The formula for rising status that I longed for with a burning thirst. Right. After drawing her fourth tooth, I had to cut off the mana flow. That's why I couldn't produce the fifth tooth. Vikir finally felt his mind clear up. It took him only about three hours to understand and memorize the theory of meat-eating, a knowledge gained like drinking water. Of course, this is thanks to the experience I have accumulated over and over again by staying at Type 4 for almost twenty years. Widely. Vikir, who had memorized the entire contents of the book, soon closed it. It's good that we've figured out how to move on to Type 4 and Type 5 and Type 6, but that's not the real purpose of coming here today. Vikir returned to the very beginning of the Mansang library. It was a space where knights standing guard and servants cleaning the library could pass by. What? Young master. Why did you come back? What did you forget? We will bring it to you. If you're hungry, should I bring you a meal? The servants speak kindly to me. Seeing the subtle respect and fear in their eyes, it seems that word of this practical evaluation has already spread. But Vikir shook his head. I'm done with my business. The servants were surprised by those words, and even the guardian knights who were standing guard were surprised. Already? Wait a little longer and then come out. Do you still have a lot of time left? Although they didn't say anything, everyone seemed very disappointed. I guess so. He turned away from the treasure-like swordsmanship textbooks stored in the depths of the Mansang library and left after just a few hours. For some people, these are valuable collections worth risking their lives to read, so it is understandable that they feel more regretful. It would have been the same even if it had been Vikir before the regression. But Vikir seemed calm. Before I leave, I'm planning to read other books as well, so just stop worrying and do your own thing. At the same time, Vikir headed to the shallowest level of the Mansang library, where miscellaneous books were collected. Several knights who were watching with their eyes shining were whispering as they looked at Vikir. If it were me, I would have read the swordsmanship textbooks deep in the depths. I must have memorized it like crazy. Are you still young and don't know its value? When I get older, I will regret today for the rest of my life. I'll have to tell the other elders not to worry. I'm just browsing through such insignificant miscellaneous books. But if they had seen the expression on Vikir's face with his back to them, they wouldn't have been talking as thoughtlessly as they were now. Vikir was looking through miscellaneous books with an expression of unprecedented determination. A place where no one cares. 
Books are arranged in a jumbled manner on this dusty bookshelf. Vikir searched slowly and painstakingly. And within a few hours, I was able to find what I wanted. The end of the library, a place that everyone can see, but that everyone passes by without thinking. There was an old book stuck there. There was quite a bit of dust accumulated on it, so it seemed like no preservation magic had been applied to it. Bikir stood for a long time and looked at the title of the book. Lurking Ambush A basic book on one meal that not even the children of the Baskervilles will read. An old book classified as a swordsmanship textbook. But who in this world knows the value of this book? Only Vakir, who had lived through the era of destruction, knew. This book can truly be called the Baskerville's greatest treasure. Geek. Vakir pulled out a book. It seemed like it had been on the bookshelf for a very long time and at first it didn't come off easily. Only after pulling out and removing several books that were blocking the way was it finally pulled out with great difficulty and revealed to the world. Lay in ambush. Vikir succeeded in removing the book and carefully swept it away with his hand. And then I turned the page. Paralak. Pages turn quickly. And soon, the reason why this book was classified as a miscellaneous book was revealed. Torn pages can be seen throughout the book. A sparse book, as if several teeth had fallen out. There are obvious tears on every important page. Of course, the content was cut off and not connected. Because of this, no one could understand the contents of this book, and as a result, it was classified as an insignificant miscellaneous book. But. I know. Vikir. Only he memorized what was written on the torn pages of this book. Before returning. This is because the memory of participating in Operation Retrieval of Torn Pages or Operation Restoration of Fallout Teeth was still clear in my mind. At that time, the hunting dog who crossed countless lines and collected all the torn and lost pages, one by one, was none other than Vikir van Baskerville.